Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel, Mormonism with the Murph, where we do a fair and objective analysis of the church and its truth claims, its history, doctrine, and policy. So I'm really excited to have back on uh, back on the show again, uh, theologian and scholar and fellow Irishman, uh, Robert Boylan. Robert, good to be back with you. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks again for having me on. Uh, last time was fun, so I'm hoping this time it'll be uh, fun and informative again. Yeah, it was it, we had a really good discussion last time. We looked at you know, was Joseph Smith the modalist between 1829 to 1834? Spoiler alert, he wasn't. Yes, yeah. So you kind of went through, um, you know, the passages that critics would point to. We looked at had a look at other passages that sort of contradict this theory. So I think you, you could say that it was a bit of a debunking, or at least if he was a modalist or held a Trinitarian view, he was not consistent. I think that was the conclusion. And, and critics, they only present maybe those things that support their theory, but um either intentionally or unintentionally don't show the things that might go against it but it was a really good discussion so people should go back and, and check that out and robert he knows the stuff really well so tonight we're going to be discussing sort of another controversy another part of joseph smith's first vision uh that can cause all people to sort of be confused a lot of critics would point to this you know was it the father and the son that appeared to joseph smith as we've been taught in the traditional narrative but there's some accounts from, you know, Joseph Smith's family members and even from some early church leaders where they talk about that it was actually the angel Moroni that appeared and, you know, told Joseph Smith, you know, which church to join. And, you know, he was forgiven of his sins. And when you look at some of those quotes, it might seem that was that actually the first vision? And then Joseph then in his later accounts talking about the visitation of the father and, and the son, was that like a later embellishment? or a change in the story and critics would sort of take that conclusion that, oh, he's just changing things. But originally it, it was the angel that that appeared to him. That's what he was telling everybody. Uh, so we're gonna be having a discussion about that and Robert's done a lot of research. So we're gonna be going through looking at sort of like the wider context and sort of like addressing a lot of these things. So I think this is gonna be a really good discussion. Anything you wanna say about Robert before we jump in? Um... No, I think that's a very good general overview. Um, the first thing we'll be discussing, of course, is like um, I'll be making the case that at least implicitly in a very strong way, there's attestation to the first vision pre-1832. Uh, but in the second part, uh, we will be discussing like, did Brigham actually teach an angel only appeared to Joseph? It was not the father and son. Uh, why was there conflation by William and Lucy at times about the first vision of Moroni and the first vision in 1820 and things like that? So um, uh, yes. hopefully, even if you're a critic of the church, you will actually um, come out and um, at least admit that a better case can be made for the historicity of the first vision than um, many believe it to be. Okay, right. Yeah, no, good points. Um, so I'm excited for us to, to dive in and to talk about these quotes and uh, to look at the wider context. Sure. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen. Um, no problem. So, and I'm just going to close my video um, and just make sure you can actually see this. Yes. Yeah, I can see that. Okay. That's perfect. I'm just going to minimize you and feel free to interject whenever you want to, but uh, this will be like part no one of the uh, two part of the uh, presentation. Uh, so attestation of the first vision in the Book of Mormon and section 20 of the Doctrine and Covenants. I also have a brief note at the end of JST, Psalm 14, uh, which may be of interest. So in 2 Nephi 27 verses 24 to 26, there's a prophecy of how Christ would actually appear and speak to the then future translator of the text. So even proceeding from like, say, a naturalistic or supernaturalistic explanation for the text, we have this following prophecy concerning its translator. And again, it shall come to pass that the Lord shall say unto him, the translator of the text, that shall read the words that shall be delivered him. For as much as this people draw near unto me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their hurt far from me, and their fear towards me is taught by the precepts of men, therefore I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, yea, a marvelous work and a wonder, for the wisdom of their wise and learned shall perish, and the understanding of the prudent shall be hid. Now, if you're familiar with the uh, different accounts of the first vision, this is actually, in many respects, not just the 1832, but the 1838 account of Jesus' words to Joseph Smith. So yeah. in this passage, or this pericope, the, um, at which he's like, in many respects, to, um, it's a, re a prophetic reworking or a midrash of sorts of Isaiah 29, uh, something that's mm -hmm. been discussed by a lot of LDS scholars over the years, um, of the future translator, because in Nephi's prophecy, 
the simile of a book is actually a real book, and there's a number of other things as well, but the translator of this real book, i.e. the Book of Mormon, will actually receive this vision from the Lord, and in context, this is about Jesus. Now, um, in terms of, say, the textual tenacity of this passage, uh, this is how it appears in the extant printer's manuscript of the Book of Mormon, page 87, mm-hmm. and uh, it's more or less uh, appears as it does in current printings of the text. Um, a few words have been like uh, modernized like as much and stuff like that, but be it as may there's no substantial change to the text. It remains uh, with the same meaning. Right. So so here in this passage, uh, Nephi, or if you even believe it's just Joseph Smith in a naturalistic explanation, prophesies of how the then future translator plates, who would be Joseph Smith, will be told by the Lord himself the words of verse 25. Now this is significant as it records one, a theophany of the Lord, uh, i.e. Jesus. And theophany is just the um, technical theological term for an appearance of a deity. Uh, it can be God, it can be Jesus. A Christophany, by the way, is the theological term for an appearance of Jesus. Uh, so the prophet Joseph, or at least the translator of the marvelous work in the wonder. And two, the words of verses 25 to 26 are quotations from, or paraphrases of, Jesus' very own words in both the 1832 and 1838 accounts of the first vision. Now, with respect yes. to the latter, note Joseph Smith History 19 in the Pearl Grey Price, which is perhaps the most well-known account of the first vision we have. I was answered that I must deny none of them, for they were all wrong, and the personage, i.e. Jesus, who addressed me said that all their creeds were an abomination in his sight, that those who, uh, professors were all corrupt, that they draw near to me with their lips, but their heart are far from me, they teach for doctrines the commandments of men, having a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. Mm. So, uh, in Jesus' words, as recorded in the 1832 account, read as follows. And he, Christ, spake unto me, saying, Joseph, my son, thy sins are forgiven thee. Go thy way, walk in my statutes, and keep my commandments. Behold, I am the Lord of glory. I was crucified for the world, that all those who believe on my name may have eternal life. Behold, the word lies in sin at this time, and none do it good, no, not one. They have turned aside from the gospel and keep not my commandments. They draw near to me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me, and mine anger is kindling against the inhabitants of the earth. They visit them according to their ungodliness, and to bring to pass that which had been spoken by the mouth of the prophets and apostles, behold, and lo, I come quickly as a re- is written of me in a cloud, clothed in the glory of my Father. So, so uh, what's the significance of this pericope? And for those who are wondering, a pericope is the term for a self-contained unit of scripture. Uh, it, one, it is the earliest account of the first vision in print. Second Nephi 27 would have been dictated in 1829, and according to John W. Welsh, it would have been June 20th, 1829. Even if one were to right. reject the Book of Mormon's authenticity, this has Joseph Smith, or at least the future translator of the plates, himself telling the reader about a Christophany, i.e. appearance of Jesus, in 1829. Two, the focus of the vision is the bringing about a marvelous work, i.e. the Book of Mormon and the establishment of the church and the spread of the gospel. See how marvelous work is used in the Book of Mormon in 1 Nephi 14, 7, 22, 8, 2 Nephi 25, 17. 29.1, 20 Nephi 21.9, 28.2. So critics cannot claim that the motivation mentioned in the 1838 account is a later invention or novelty, or that the 1838 account is a motivated reworking of the 1832 account to deal with the then contemporary challenges Joseph Smith was facing with respect to, say, church leadership and other things like that. Now, my friend right. uh, Tanner Johnson actually pointed this out to me in October uh, 2019, and I think it holds pretty well. Um, as an aside, marvelous work in the Book of Mormon, it's not simply the Book of Mormon, it's the Book of Mormon and the Church or some other organization used to establish the gospel among the Gentiles and the Jews. Uh, there's a number of passages, uh, for instance, 2 Nephi 29.1, which is in the context of this passage. But behold, there shall be many at that day when I shall proceed to do a marvelous work among them, that I may remember my covenants which I have made unto the children of men, that I may set my hand again the second time to recover my people which are of the house of Israel. So there's not just a scriptural text in the passage, there's a corporate entity here, the establishment of a church or the new Israel that will uh, be the result of this um, prophecy. And marvelous work appears in a few other passages as well in the Book of Mormon. I'll just let people look in at this. Oh, uh, yeah, it's kind of mentioned through art, isn't it? Yeah. And this actually has been picked up by a few LDS. I mean, Tanner pounded out this me in October 2019. I shared it with a few others, and they actually thought it holds up pretty well. In one random LDS book I read uh, for a different project, uh, Alan Neal, uh, Book of Mormon Prophecies for Our Day, he actually picks up this as well, tying it into Isaiah 29, as well as the first vision. So there's other LDS as well who believe this to be, in some respects, a prophecy of the first vision. Mm. Uh, so It's, it's interesting because just... I've read that passage before in DNC 27, and yes, I, I noticed the similarities between, you know, they draw near to me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me, and how that's, you know, s- similar if not identical language to what uh, the Lord says to Joseph Smith 
in his both 1838 and 1832 account. But I, I never noticed, you know, that first part um, where it says that the Lord will say this to the the translator. Yeah. Um, I, if you go back to the verse and it, it, it shall come to pass that the Lord shall say unto him. So this is like a prophecy of what the Lord will say unto pretty much whoever brings forth yeah. this book, the translator of the book, which I've never noticed that before. As like a prophecy of the Lord appearing and conversing with Joseph Smith. And also it bars the, from the verbiage of the 1832 and 1838 accounts. And as we yeah. see at the end of this, JST Psalm 14, which would be contemporary with the 1832 account of the first vision. Um, so I just thought I'd point that out. Um, again, my thanks to Tanner Johnson for pointing this out. But if his approach to this holds up, and I think it does, at the very least, we have a pre-1830 here, 1829, June 1829, account of there being some appearance of the Lord, i.e. Jesus, to Joseph mm. Smith. So, yeah. And uh, maybe Joseph Smith, although the first vision, if you believe it happened in 1820, um, it would have already happened to him. But you wonder when he translated this verse, if he even, if he knew that was like a fulfillment of the prophecy or he was just translating the text and wasn't even aware. Um, but yeah, whenever you look into it, it, it does seem like a, a prophecy of the Lord appearing and saying those things to Joseph Smith. Yeah, and again, like, uh, as with the modalism discussion last time, I mean, you don't even have to hold your supernatural view of the uh, Book of Mormon's origins to uh, accept that this is some type of prediction in the text. So it begs mm. the question, when was it fulfilled? You know, and because of me, you do have, like, if you think it's Joseph uh, making an up whole cause, you have Joseph addressing himself as the future translator of the plates, you know, supposedly yeah. having this prediction that the Lord would actually speak to him and then, interestingly, use the verbiage of the 1832 account and the 1838 account, uh, respectively, three and nine years before he would actually write them down. You know, so he's clearly not, although the 1832 account did appear um, because of contemporary uh, concerns and the 1838 account did appear in respects because of contemporary concerns, that doesn't explain at all. You know, uh, it's not like, say, a pure invention, you know, um, there's like pre-existing issues going on as well, mm. if that makes sense. Yes, no, that, that makes sense. Cool. Uh, any questions about that, or uh, do you want me to uh, address this passage? No, as well? no, I think that's, I think what you said as well, like even if you hold a naturalist view that Joseph Smith wrote the Book of Mormon, um, if, if he did, then he wrote in a prophecy of the Lord appearing to him uh, and, you know, telling him they draw near to me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. So he's referring to his first vision experience, even if he made it all up, he's referring to it in in the book of mormon so it wasn't just a later invention when he told his first vision accounts yeah and all the more so when we're told by like uh, dan vogel and others that there's quote unquote predictions in the book of mormon like say the three and eight witnesses that joseph self-fulfilled if you will um, mm -hmm. so where's the self-fulfillment of this if there's a purely nationalistic explanation and it's not simply like a born again experience um it's yeah it's actually a vision here yes so i think that's pretty important uh you know, uh, want me to go on to uh, this passage now? Yeah, I think before you read it, uh, th this one, I know, um, well, maybe we can read it first and then I'll yeah, say yeah. what critics might say, but I will read it first. Yeah, sure. Uh, this is section 20, verses 5 to 6, and the language of manifestation, uh, evidence of a pre eating theophany, i.e. appearance of God, in section 20 of the Doctrine and Covenants, which was written in April of 1830. So, again, pre-1832. Yes. Um, now, uh, in section 20, verses 5 to 6, we read, After it was truly manifested unto this first elder, that is, Joseph Smith, that he had received a remission of his sins, he was entangled again in the vanities of the world. But after repenting and humbling himself sincerely through fate, God ministered unto him by an holy angel, whose countenance was as lightning, and whose garment were pure and white above all other whiteness. Now, many Latter-day Saints have argued that this... Uh, argued that in this text we have an early allusion to the first vision. Uh, there's been a lot written about this, but I wish to focus on verse 5's use of manifested. Now, what is important about this is that this is the language of theophany, i.e. an appearance of God, whether of Jesus and or the Father. Now, we see this in both the King James New Testament, which clearly did influence the theological language and worldview of Joseph Smith, and the Book of Mormon, showing that this concept was part and parcel of Joseph Smith's theological vocabulary prior to 1830, adding further plausibility that this uh, to this being an allusion to a theophany, i.e. the first vision. So, um... Right. No, I know, um, so I'm going to put on my, my critical okay. hat here. I know a critic would 
maybe interpret that and we know critics like maybe Dan Vogel uh, and others might believe that this verse um, yeah it, it was manifest unto him that he received a remission of his sins um, uh, like a born again Joseph experience but something yeah, yeah years yeah. earlier a born again experience and maybe he felt you know a spiritual manifestation exactly. that his sins were forgiven um, but that it doesn't mean that it was God and Jesus that appeared yeah. to him and yeah. that it was the Lord that forgave him of his sins yeah um, yeah uh, basically the TLD or version of that would be this is recording some prior to the appearance of the angel i.e. pre-September of 1823 but it's a much more nebulous event like a born again experience it's not like say a heavenly manifestation that like Latter-day Saints like myself believe happened but it definitely refers to that he received remission of his sins exactly before the angel uh visited yeah. himself because after repenting humbling himself sincerely then God ministered to him by an angel so there was some sort of a remission of sins experience mm -hmm. then some critics would say oh it was a born again experience whereas we believe oh no that was when the lord uh, appeared to him and forgave him of his sins as yeah. he talks about in the 1832 account yeah um well the critics are half right uh it was some type mm -hmm. of uh, experience where he was re uh, received a remission of sins but um, yes as we'll see like if you look at manifest and manifested in joseph smith's vocabulary of this time it's not consistent with a nebulous born again experience merely it's actually an appearance of god and all uh, for instance uh, mm -hmm. now this is how the text appears in revelation book one page 53 so again um there's no issues when it comes to the text of this passage um i just throw that out for critics who might say like it was a reworking it's not so uh for instance uh in first Timothy three sixteen, and i'll be quoting from the king james because that of course uh was the bible joseph used it would have informed his vocabulary uh, in 1 Timothy 3.16, an early Christological confession, according to most scholars, we read, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Now, this is speaking actually about Jesus, not God the Father. But yes. notice how it was God was manifested in the flesh. This is about the incarnation that is the physical appearance of Jesus on the earth, not some kind of nebulous experience. And mm -hmm. that's from the King James. Uh, I do note, if you're reading like a modern translation, it's going to read a bit differently. Uh, it will say he who instead of God. Um, the difference between Tetus Sigma, uh, us, which means he who, and Tetus Sigma, uh, Omicron Sigma, I should say, and also Tetus Sigma, which is, it's, it's called a um uh, sacra, basically an abbreviation of Teos. Um, but the King James reads, God was manifested in flesh, speaking of Jesus. But even if it was he who was manifested in flesh, it's still speaking of Jesus appearing physically on mm -hmm. the earth. Uh, another text is Titus 2.13, where the King James uses the concept of manifestation for both the Father and the Son, uh, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, glorious appearing is epiphania, uh, alternatively epiphany or manifestation, uh, the noun form being phanerao in 1 Timothy 3.16. So the idea, like, say, Jesus uh, having a manifestation or a glorious appearing in the past and uh, future is actually part of the theological vocab of the King James New Testament. And... Uh, Personally, from say uh, King James influence on the Book of Mormon and things like that, there's no question the King James did influence Joseph at a theological level, even right. pre 1830. Um, so, if I'm understand, you're right. The point you're making is the word sort of manif manifest or manifested used in the King James Bible um, is to mean like God or, or actual Jesus appearance, not actually, even, yeah, yeah, appearing and revealing Himself, uh, not just you know the spirit but his phys him physically appearing yeah it, it's himself. more tangible than like say a testimony or like say a, mm. uh stuff like that uh this is actually strange when you actually look at manifest and other uh similar terms in the book of mormon uh manifest is used in the book of mormon in many senses including the incarnation of jesus as well as appearances to prophets and nations um i won't read all this just for time but like um you know, First Nephi ten seventeen, First Nephi thirteen forty two, like how Christ will manifest Himself into nations and the Jews. You know, it's eschatological here. Uh, One Nephi fifteen thirteen, um, Second Nephi six nine. You know, how Christ should manifest Himself unto them in the flesh, and after He should manifest Himself, they shall scourge Him and crucify Him, according to the words of the angel who spake it unto me. This is not like a um and have this experience it's a physical spatial space time experience if you will same with second nephi 25 12 and 14 uh 32 6 um jacob 4 11 how christ was manifested uh himself in the flesh before jacob uh that's not like mm -hmm. a nebulous experience it's some type of either vision or some other event that appeared in space and time enos 1 8 alma 45 10 uh rather 
Helaman eight twenty two to twenty three, second uh three Nephi ten eighteen, uh which was I don't think anyone will claim this was a nebulous experience like how Christ manifested himself into the Nephites. That was the physical space time event. Um, yes, yeah. Uh, 2 Nephi 1523, compare 16.2. Now, here Christ is negating an appearance to the Gentiles, but he uses the term manifest here for an appearance. He just negates it, not manifest myself unto them. Um, you know, so. Uh, Eater 4 4. Uh, behold, I have written upon these plates the very things which the brother Jared saw, and there never were greater things made manifest than those which were made manifest unto the brother Jared. And of course, we know Jared actually, the brother Jared had a vision of the pre mortal Jesus, even seen him bodily, you know. Uh, Eater 12 30 to 31 reads, For the brother Jared said unto the mount, uh, mountain Zerin, Remove, and it was removed, and if he had not had fate, it would not have moved. Wherefore thou workest after men, a fate for dust did thou manifest thyself unto thy, thy disciples. Again, manifest in the context of Brother Jared is a theophany or a Christophany here. Mm -hmm. So as I know here, in the King James New Testament, which clearly has a strong influence on his Joseph's theological vocab, as well as the Book of Mormon, very explicitly I would argue, to manifest would often have the sense of an appearance of deity, predominantly that of Jesus. And sometimes as with Titus 2.13 of King James, both the Father and the Son. Adding further strength to the claim that in section 20, we have an early April 1830 allusion to a theophany, i.e. the first vision. Right. I did not realize how much the word manifest is actually in the Book of Mormon and the King James Bible. But that's really interesting that you've shown that the word manifest is Jesus, mostly Jesus. Um, yep. You said the scripture in Titus is both the Father and the Son. Uh, in, God, in the King um, James, yes. Uh, some yeah. translate the Greek construction as the, uh, the glorious... Uh, as a reference to only Jesus, like he's God um, and Savior in that mm. passage. Uh, they argue based on Greek grammar, but the King James, which influenced Joseph as the father and son, basically. Ah, uh, yeah. But it's interesting that it refers to, it uses the word manifest, but in a very physical, literal appearance uh, yeah. to the people, to the Nephites, uh, and then to, you know, to Joseph Smith in, in Doctrine and Covenants 20. No, that's interesting. Yeah. That's a really yeah. good point. And also, uh, before uh, in this particular section, uh, this is not something that's only been noted by Latter-day Saints. Um, there was a PhD dissertation in German that was translated and published by By Common Consent Press. So maybe you're familiar with the blog By Common Consent. Mm -hmm. It was by uh, Frederick S. Kleiner, who's not LDS, uh, and he commented uh, near the end of his book on the language manifest in the Book of Mormon. Um, he noted on page 417, the word manifest occurs 51 times, and there are five instances of the noun manifestation. Each of these instances involve the power of the divine and either access to it or its effect upon the world. Now, uh, it's true that it is used in an ethical sense, like a sinner manifesting to others he has been redeemed. Such cases of manifest being used in this sense is that of mortals shown other mortals of their redeemed state and change of heart and mind, as known on pages 417 to 18 of this book. However, when a heavenly being, whether God, Jesus, angels, manifests something to a prophet, it is not in some nebulous sense. Instead, it is of a divine appearance or some other revelatory event. Mm. Um, I'm not going to read all of it, but like um, he actually has a very good section, for instance, Revelation to a prophet. Prophets receive revelation by having things made manifest through the Spirit of God. Nephi, the first Nephi, lays out this principle to his family in 1 Nephi 22, verse 2. A revelation to a prophet is defined by its contact with the transcendent and divine. The duty of a prophet is often to know the future and to warn the people of the consequences should they not repent. This foreknowledge also involves teachings of things before they occur, such as the coming of Christ. But uh, commenting on Jacob 7, 2, in the second paragraph, Jacob uh, says, Knowledge of the coming of Christ and his salvation truly have been made manifest unto us concerning our people, what things should happen unto them. And we also had many revelations and the spirit of much prophecy, wherefore we know of Christ and his kingdom, which should come. These revelatory foreknowledge is repeated by Jacob in these discussions with Sherm, who denies that prophets can know of the coming of Christ. Jacob counters this accusation by saying that the coming of Christ hath been made manifest unto me, for I have heard and see, for I have heard and seen, and it also had made manifest unto me by the power of the Holy Ghost. Here seeing and hearing a vision are also created with manifestation. So Jacob actually had a vision of the then future Messiah, and he uses a language of manifestation. Mm, you know, okay, so, so maybe the, the Messiah um, didn't appear to him physically, but he had some sort of a vision. Yeah, uh, at, the very, at, the, very, as a manifestation as at well. the very least, he saw Jesus in some type of vision. Okay. That's, the min that's minimally. Now there's personal revelation by the Spirit. Um, there's no question like the language of manifest and manifestation can actually appear uh, consistent with the nebulous experience. But um, in the flesh, 
Mm -hmm. Uh, The most common usage of the verb in the Book of Mormon is in connection with Christ showing himself physically. The text repeatedly mentions that Christ will manifest himself in the flesh, and there's a number of verses there. Even though these manifestations take place in different times, their shared characteristic is that of God, that God is made flesh and he's physically present. The first instance is the birth and early ministry of Jesus Christ in Palestine, which ended with his crucifixion and resurrection. Nephi describes this as the time that he should manifest himself unto the children of men. So this was like a physical, the very first physical coming of Christ, you know, the incarnation. This wasn't like a nebulous event. He manifested himself in the world. This was like a space-time event, if you will. Mm. And then he mentions like uh, the Theophany of Christ the Lehites, you know, which of course in turn Nephi 10 is a tangible event for the Nephites. It's not like, say, Christ revealed himself only spiritually, like, um, you know, uh, giving spiritual sensations or visions to the people. He physically, space and time, appeared to them. You yeah. Know, um, and, of course, like the second coming. Uh, the final instance of physical manifestations of Christ is at the second coming. The Book of Mormon says that the important difference between the manifestation and the one in Palestine and to the Lehites is that this will be the, to the entire world. 1 Nephi 13 43. The manifestation was started with his birth was only restricted to a small geographical area. The second coming of manifestations was only among the Lehites. Nephi says that this manifesting will occur in the spirit of power and in power and great glory and in the flesh. This mm. promise is already found in the title page and also that the convincing of the Jew and Gentiles that Jesus is Christ, the eternal God, manifesting himself unto all nations. The theological truthfulness of these prophecies is not relevant here. Only that manifest also covers these grand cosmic shows of transcendent power and most importantly, that these grand displays use the same verb as individual private experiences of contact with the divine. And that's a non-LDS scholar on the use of manifest and like terms in the Book of Mormon. It's interesting that a non Latter-day Saint scholar um, also holds this view. Like this isn't just, um, you know, faithful scholars who you might say have some bias perhaps yeah. to uh, have to, this to, interpretation. Yeah. Of no, to be fair, let me, let, let me just note, like he's not commenting on section 20 here. Uh, he's only commenting on language and manifest and manifestation in the Book of Mormon. So I'm not saying ipso facto he's arguing that Section 20 is a theophany. But in light of the Book of Mormon, which clearly did influence Joseph Smith's vocabulary, or at least reflects his vocabulary as a translator, the language and manifest and manifestation often, especially when it comes to Jesus, is that of theophany, not simply like a nebulous uh, subjective experience. Okay. Gotcha. So you, you, you would say that most likely the interpretation and understanding of that verse in DNC 20, um, it's not referring to a spiritual manifestation like um, a born again experience, but a, a literal manifestation, the Lord Jesus Christ appearing to him and yeah. forgiving him of yeah. his sins. That's what I, I mean, at the very least, the appearance of a member of the Godhead. Now, um, okay. I would say it's actually both because like, of course, it would be like a spiritual experience. I don't want to like say it's a... Uh, a false dichotomy, but at the same time, it's not only some type of personal spiritual experience, it was a theophany, um, you know, so. Okay. No, that, I, 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 th- that I think the good. case, I think uh, in light of, say, these considerations, the case that section 20 verses 5 to 6 has a pre-1823, because it speaks about before the angel Moroni, pre-1823 evidence of a theophany is actually much stronger than um, even other fellow LDS have uh, presented the case to be. Yeah, and I, I, to be honest, I think most members of the church, whether faithful or critical, probably wouldn't have taken much thought of the word manifest. I know I, I probably would have just brushed over it and not thought of the implications that that would be re- alluding to an actual theophany, a physical appearance of a member of the Godhead. Uh, to be fair, uh, this came about, uh, my lang- my study of like the language of manifestation came about with uh, inter- interacting with uh, informed Unitarians who don't believe Jesus pre-existed. Uh, First Timothy 3.16 is a very good text for the personal pre-existence of Jesus, and that led to my studying this for the uh, language of manifestation elsewhere in uh, the Book of Mormon. So uh-huh. it, it, I, I may have overlooked it if it wasn't for some Christadelphians and others. <laughs> <laughs> you got them to thank. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, just I have two quick slides on JST Sam 14. So, uh, do you have any other comments on section 20 before we go on to that? No, no. Okay. Uh, well, let me make a uh, statement. I can't go into too much detail, but um, Walker Wright and Don Bradley. I'm sure you've heard of Don Bradley. Yeah. Uh, they have a forthcoming article on Sam 14 JST in uh, the BYU studies. Uh, hopefully, in the near future. Uh, but basically, uh, JST Sam 14. Uh, it comes from Old Testament Manuscript 2, pages 85 to 86, which is dated between late July 1832 and 2nd July 1833. Uh, so it's rather contemporary, contemporaneous with uh, the writing of the 1832 account of the first vision. Now, what's rather interesting is that JST Sam 14 contains verbiage 
attributed to Jesus, similar to, like, say, the prophecy in the Book of Mormon, common to not just the 1832 account, but also the later 1838 First Vision account. Um, if you actually, um, and this is the language of JST Psalm 14, and if you're familiar with both the 1832 but the later 1838 account of the First Vision, it actually contains a lot of the verbiage that Christ actually said to Joseph Smith. Uh, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no man that hath seen God, because he shows himself not unto us, therefore there is no God. Behold, they are corrupt, they have done abominable works, and none of them do it good. For the Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men, and by his vice said unto his servant, Seek ye among the children of men, to see if there are any that do understand God. And he opened his mouth unto the Lord, and said, Behold, all these who say they are dying, the Lord answered and said, They are all um, gone aside, they are altogether become filthy. Thou canst uh, behold none of those, these that are doing good, no, not one. All they have for their teachers um, are workers of iniquity, and there is no knowledge in them. They are they who eat up my people, they eat bread, and call not upon the Lord. They are in great fear, for God dwells in the generation of the righteous. He is the counsels of the poor, because they are ashamed of the wicked, and flee unto the Lord for their refuge. They are ashamed of the counsels of the poor, because the Lord is his refuge. O that Zion were established out of heaven, the salvation of Israel, O Lord, when wilt thou establish Zion? When the Lord brings back the captivity of his people, Jacob shall rejoice, Israel shall be glad. So there's actually um, some vocabulary and some verbiage, I should say, that is attributed to Jesus, not just in the 1832 account, but the later 1838 account, like mm. all the people doing abominations. What's rather interesting as yes. well is like one of the more significant changes to JST Psalm 14 is that the King James says the fool had said in his heart, uh, there's no God. But the fool here says no man had seen God. Uh, so it's kind of a refutation of like no man can see God. Maybe that's something we can discuss in the near future as well. Oh uh, uh, yeah. yeah, okay. Oh, I didn't, I didn't notice that. Yeah, there is no man that hath seen God. Yeah. Okay, and therefore there is no. Okay, and yeah, you said there's some similar ver verbiage like. Yeah, um... it's similar to like uh, what I was saying about Second Nephi twenty seven twenty four to twenty six, where like some of the verbiage that appears there appears in the eighteen thirty eight account, not the eighteen thirty two account, and uh... some of the verbiage here uh, from the Lord, you know, decrying the people. Um, it does seem to have like uh, strong parallels to some of the verbiage in the 1838 account, uh, not the, not merely the contemporary 1832 account of the first vision. Okay. Uh, and as so... I said, like uh, Walker Wright and uh, Don Bradley have a forthcoming article, which I'm sure will go into more detail than this, but uh, that's to whet everyone's appetite. Okay. And maybe you're going to get to this because um, you've talked about the, the parallels between, um, so this is Psalm 14 in the Joseph Smith translation. So this would have been what, 1831? Uh, well, it that came that transcription comes from Old Testament manuscript two eighty five to eighty six, July eighteen thirty two to second July eighteen thirty three. So we're in contemporary okay. eighteen thirty two okay. account of the first vision. Okay, uh, and what's sort of like your overall point, just with the parallels between this and eighteen thirty two and eighteen thirty eight account? Just oh, it, it, it shows that the language and some of the themes in the eighteen thirty eight account are not influenced merely by contemporary events. Uh, they're in mm. the background already years before these events purport the influence in total uh, some of the uh, concepts in the uh, 1838 account of the first vision okay gotcha no i think um a, a critic if i'm trying to think what well, a critic might say oh well he's thinking about those things they're going on around in his mind and then he's, he's putting them in the joe smith translation and then he's taking those things and then like adding them into his first vision accounts um as he's retelling it over time um what 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 sort of would you have a quick response to that if a critic would sort of interpret it that way perhaps uh if one holds even if one holds a supernatural like where if you like would they can still be a naturalist when it comes to mormonism that's yeah. possible but uh it does kind of show at the very least some of the themes and the ideas informing the 1838 account that we find in the account are not novelties or simply the result of interacting with then contemporary events right so, I, so you're basically saying that uh, this shows that Joe Smith didn't just, for example, his 1838 account, he didn't just come up with it then because of or, the yeah, or he's like, uh, Or he's responding, like, say, challenges to his leadership uh, yes. merely and things like that. It's like, no, this would have been part and parcel, if you will, of the written record, uh, whether directly or indirectly about the first vision, before he would put pen to paper for the 1838 account and other things like that. Because, like, uh, some critics, not all, but, like, some would say, well, a lot of the ideas, certain purported novelties, if you will, of, say, the different accounts are Joseph responding to then contemporary events. 
So like uh, you yeah. know, the language of Jesus that. is like changed to suit his agenda. It kind of shows, well, this is not necessarily the case. Like there's a lot, it's a bit more nuanced and a bit more complex than this. And mm -hmm. the case for Joseph's uh, truthfulness, if you will, is better than how it's generally presented. Okay. No, that's a, that's a good point. Put myself back on. So um, any comments or questions about that? Or hopefully that made some sense. No, that, uh, that that actually did. Um, those were really good insights, especially um, what you shared about DNC twenty. Um, I thought that was really interesting because that's it's something I'd never picked up on before, and also with Psalms fourteen, um, ne never actually I think even read that passage in the JST. So that was no really good insights that you're showing there. Uh, so do you want to move on to the uh, next section, like a Let's do LDS it. leaders? Yeah, let me just um, see if I can share my screen. <laughs> Can you see the PDF? I can, yes. Okay, good. Uh, do you want to like start like maybe what's the TLDR version of this and maybe we can work through this? Uh, so this quote... Oh, no, no. Th th uh, this is a preface to my comments for the rest of it. So it's okay. You can ignore this for the moment. Okay. Yeah, well, so there's uh, quotes from certain leaders of the church uh, that critics would point to. Uh, for example, people like Brigham Young, Orson Hyde, um, I think Heber C. Kimball as well um have, who else john taylor um and also like oliver cardry yeah uh, and, and there's quotes of them you know referring to the angel visiting joseph smith i think most of them say 1823 maybe some quotes don't actually give a date but that it was the angel that appeared and told him which church to join um and forgive him of his sins and i think there's even one or two quotes that make it seem that you know the lord didn't come to and appeared him and delivered the message, but it was the angel. Um, I think there's one quote, it might be Heber C. Kimball, who says, you know, the Lord didn't come with the armies of heaven. Uh, Brigham you know, Young. Oh, Brigham Young. Okay. Uh, I'm getting muddled up there. It's okay. Um, but yeah, so then critics would uh, interpret that as, oh, you know, when he was telling people about his first vision, he wasn't telling them about, um, you know, the father and the son. He was just telling them the angel. So kind of like what I said at the beginning, he, He's changing or evolving his story. And, you know, the, the visitation of the father and the son was not something being emphasized or really told by Joseph Smith, you know, by the church leaders. Yeah, I think that's a good overview. So um, do you want me to uh, begin? Um, and we can actually uh, stop and start every so often. But yeah, let's um, do it. Yeah. The, the, the following comes from like Adonasius, uh, one of the most important early Christians after um, post the first council of Nicaea. And his quote is rather apropos. He's interacting with Arians, like his theological opponents, and they're quoting the works of a fellow of, uh, by the name of Dionysus. You know, and uh, he says in his work, uh, yes, he, Dionysus, wrote it, and we too admit that his letter runs to us. But just as he wrote this, he also wrote many other letters, and they ought to consult those also, in order that the fate of the man may be made clear for from them all, and not from this alone. Um, and basically this is the whole, uh, yes, Brigham may have said, this but he also said a bunch of other things as well and the same when it comes mm. to like other people so you have to take for each person and I'm, i know you agree with me on this you have to take yeah. their entire uh writings or sermons on a particular topic uh you know you have to take the entire ball of wax so yeah I think this don't just like, cherry pick one or yeah. two quotes that support yeah, that yeah. position but then ignore others that may go against it it's kind of the same with them you know the episode we did on modalism in the book of mormon and other yeah. scriptural writings yeah it's like uh, yeah mosiah 15 1 to 5 on the face value is a difficult text to interpret but if you read the isaiah passage that's quoted in total beforehand and everything else that's said afterwards of all the active possible interpretations you can't hold to the modalist interpretation yeah you know? and, and it's kind of similar to this like yes brigham may have said or orson hyde may have said this on one occasion but he also said things before and afterwards and you have to take the entire ball of wax for each author. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, before we kind of uh, discuss like individual authors, like there's a few things, you know, one should always practice this interaction with. First, uh, the first vision was already being published. Um, a lot of these quotes come say 1850s, 1860s. That's right. But the first vision was already published. Like you have the Wentworth letter. It's not like say, you know, it was only in Joseph's 1832 journal. This was being published like in the Times and Seasons and the Millennial Star, you know, in uh, the UK, US, and even as we'll see, as Denmark as well and it was not an esoteric teaching in the US or the UK like some early critics like John Hyde who will quote momentarily and Stenhouse would argue that some of the more difficult or esoteric teachings like plural marriage and Adam God 
were actively withheld from members or potential converts in the UK. Uh, now, even presenting from that debate, um, this is not the case for the first vision. It was actually published and known even by then future critics of the church from England. Um, and also Orson Pratt actually published the first vision in Scotland in 1840, and we'll quote Pratt momentarily. Yeah. Also, the uh, the first vision, uh, the first edition of the Pearl Great Price was published in England in 1851, and this was actually uh, a text because many of the Quorum of the Twelve would serve missions and stuff like that. They knew about this, um, you know, where it speaks of like say Jesus, uh, Joseph in 1820, uh, seeing the Father and the Son. The Father points to Jesus, says, "This is my beloved Son." Here, it's the traditional narrative of the first vision. I won't read it all, but you know, it appears on pages 38 to 39 of the 1851 Pearl Great Price. So and it, like, sorry, is this from Orson Pratt's um, secondhand account? Oh no, this is uh, no, this is from the uh, what's now published in the Pearl Grey Price today. Oh okay. Uh, we'll quote Pratt momentarily, but this is uh, basically our first vision was published in 1851 in the very popular tract, later canonical work, the Pearl Grey Price in England. So this is not like an, even then this is not necessary to our teaching, uh, you know, at this time uh, point in time. So. And even like, um, and the first vision was actually being published in the Desert News throughout, like the 1850s, 1860s, 1870s. I came across this this morning. It's like Alma L. Smith in a letter to the editor, November 11, 1875, in the Desert News, um, where he's recounting a conference in Lai, Oahu, in the Sandwich Islands. And I know I butchered the pronunciation of those places, uh, mm. where he says, during the afternoon and part of the evening, he, Edwin Woolley, Read considerable in several of her books, read the account of the Pearl Great Price of the first vision of the Prophet Joseph Smith, he's finding the plates, the organization of the church, etc. So even in the Sandwich Islands, you actually have Edwin Woolley and other Latter day Saints teaching the first vision from the Pearl Great Price. Mm. You know, and this is not the first vision of Moroni, this is the appearance of Jesus and God the Father to the Sa in the Sandwich Islands in eighteen seventy five. Contemporary with Brigham Young. Um, right. You also have the Life of Joseph Smith, Desert News, May twenty ninth, eighteen fifty two. Uh where I gave, i.e. Erastus Holmes, and this is Joseph Smith, a brief relation of my experience while in my juvenile years, say from six years up to the time I received the first visitation of angels, which was when I was about 14 years of old. So he would have been 14, 18, 19, 1820. So this is the first vision. Now, he does use first visitation of angels. Maybe in a future show we can discuss like angels being used for deity, but be it as may, first vision of heavenly beings at the very least in 1852. It's not simply a single angel. It's plural angels yes. here and again note the year 1852 in the desert news this is not some kind of um, esoteric publication this is the main newspaper of the people in the area and on a side note doesn't joseph smith mention is it in his 1835 account that there is also many angels yeah, yeah he mentions like two heavenly, well. being, two heavenly persons and then also mentions like and there were also many heavenly uh also many angels as well so mm. Uh, yeah, also the Desert News, and some of these I just picked up this morning, uh, I just thought I'd include them because they haven't really been well discussed. So, Desert News, July 2nd, 1877, uh, announcement of the first vision and other Joseph Smith-related accounts in Danish. Um, Joseph Smith the Prophet, the first number of this work in the Danish language will be issued tomorrow. The compilers and editors are brothers A. Jensen, i.e. Andrew Jensen, he was a church historian, and J.E. Brune purpose publishing it in uh, monthly parts, and then they give the parts, Parentage of Joseph Smith, The Prophet, Early Education, Youth, Religious Impression, First Vision, and distinct to that, Visit the Angel Moroni. Ah, uh, okay. Um, in the 1857 book, Andrew So it Moore, doesn't complete the First Vision with the yeah. visitation from Moroni. They're and this is 1877, so. Right. Um, in the 1857 book, uh, which was written by a British convert to the church who would leave. Uh, John uh, John Hyde's book, Mormonism, Its Leaders and Designs, 1857, page 199. Uh, he gives a chronology of the history of the church. And under April of 1820, Smith pretends to receive his first vision while praying in the woods. He asserts that God the Father and Jesus Christ came to him from the heavens and like Muhammad's Gabriel, told him that his sins were forgiven, that he was the chosen of God to reinstate his kingdom and reintroduce the gospel, that none of the denominations were right, etc. This is even like an anti-Mormon book in 1857. Yeah. Uh, what what's Oh, yeah. Uh, John Hyde's book, Mormonism, Its Leaders and Designs, 1857, page 199. Right. And this is on archive.org. I have a print copy, but it's also on archive.org. What's rather interesting, and this is an aside, is if you read the early material on the first vision in the Tanners, they used to claim no critic of the church knew about the appearance of the father and his son until like the 1860s or 1870s. When Hyde's book here was actually pointed out to them, they had to uh, do a revision of some of their arguments. So uh, this is a pretty important book. 
for many reasons. Because uh, really, that's not many years after Joseph Smith's death. No, just 13 years. Yeah. And this also shows it was not an esoteric teaching because Hyde was a convert from Britain. Mm -hmm. So this kind of shows like it was a disseminated teaching. It wasn't like, say, an esoteric teaching because if the critical approach is correct, like even not even the upper echelons of the church, like Taylor and Brigham, and we'll review some of them now, knew about mm -hmm. the first vision, you know, uh, father and son appearing in a trinity before Moroni. Um, how is like some normie, like Sean Hyde, actually gained this information? Yeah, that, that, that's a good point. And I just have a question. Go ahead. So were the missionaries, would you say by the 1850s or even the 40s, would they have been talking about Joseph Smith's first vision when they were converting people then? Uh, my view is like in the early days of the church, the first vision was Moroni's visit to Joseph Smith. Yes. Uh, Joseph only later in his life realized the global importance of the first vision. Yeah, uh, so people would have known about personal. the first vision, but like Joseph would have just maybe viewed it for the most part as like a private affair, but he didn't, only later in his life would he realize like it's global import. So that's why there seems to be a conflation, we'll discuss it near the end, amongst Lucy and William of a conflation of the first vision and of the father and son and first vision of Moroni. And that has led to some issues. But um, I do believe like for them, they would have been teaching the gospel and it would have been it would have grown um, from more like incidental missioning to like a more central thing. Like um, when you served your mission, I'm sure that would be like one of the very first things. Yeah. It wouldn't be like as central as it was then, but it was clearly talked about, discussed and written about. So uh, how they would have presented it, I don't know off the top of my head, but they clearly didn't know about it. You know? Yeah. Cause by 1842, that's when it was published. So most, of the prominent leaders, most of the missionaries you would think would have been aware it, of it. It doesn't make sense that they wouldn't have known about it. Yeah. Because it was published uh, in uh, basically for the church globally, because like US and the UK, that would be where the substantial sum of members were. And like yeah. the 12 did serve missions in England and so forth. So uh, I just don't buy the theory, and we'll see why that Taylor and all were ignorant about the first mission or fudge things pretty badly. I mean, I'm open to the fact they may have been inconsistent or slipped up here and there, you know, but at the same time, uh, not to the degree where if you were to read the Tanners or some other people, like uh, the substantial, not accidental slip ups, if you will. Mm. And perhaps this is just me speculating, perhaps because Joseph Smith didn't emphasize it much during his life until the end of his life. So maybe when they converted into the church, the first vision wasn't a big part of um, their sort of view of Joseph Smith as a prophet or their conversion. So maybe... That's why they sort of downplayed it or maybe at times didn't mention it, but then you're probably going to show other times where they did mention it. Yeah. So. Uh, the first person we'll look at, if that's okay, is John Taylor, uh, the third person of the church. Um, now, he actually explicitly mentions the first vision or aspects of the first vision on a couple of occasions. Um, for instance, this is from letter from Elder John Taylor to the editor and interpreter Anglais et Francais, Latter-day Saint Millennial Star, from August 1st, 1850, and the letter itself was dated June 25th, 1850. So we have something published in August of 1850, dating the original dating to June of 1850. So this is pretty early. And it mentions, like, um, you know, the background to Joseph Smith. Uh, he speaks about the religious revival. I won't read all of this, but when the revival was over, there was a contention as to which of these various societies the person who was converted should be, uh, belong. One of his fathers found the giant one society and another a different one. His mind was troubled. He saw contention, contention instead of peace and division instead of union. And when he reflected upon the uh, multifarious creeds and professions there were in existence, he thought impossible for all to be right. And if God taught one, he did not teach the others. For God is not the author of confusion. In reading his Bible, he was remarkably struck with the passage in James, first chapter, fifth verse. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that gives to all men liberally and unbraids not, and it shall be given him. Believing in the word of God, he retired into a grove and called upon the Lord to give him wisdom in relation to this matter. While he was thus engaged, he was surrounded by a brilliant light, and two glorious personages presented themselves before who exactly resembled each other in features, and who gave him information upon the subject which had been previously agitated in his mind. He was given to understand that the churches were um, churches were all of them in error with regard to many things, and he was commanded not to go after them, and he received a promise that fullness of the gospel should at some future time be unfolded unto him, after which the vision withdrew, leaving his mind in a state of calmness and peace. So here, you know, uh, John uh, James 1, 5, being read in the context of religious contention, wanting to know which church is true, two personages who resembled each other appeared to him and told him not to join any church, they were all wrong, and so forth. So 
Um, if one wants to be hypercritical, it says, well, it doesn't explicitly say it's God, the Father, and Jesus, but who else could it be? Yeah, no, it, it, and it's very similar. It, it's almost like identical. Is it the 1842 account in the John Wentworth letter? That one, Yeah. his, his accounting there, it just seems dead consistent with both the 1838 and 1842 account. And if Elder John uh, Taylor wrote this in 1850, then he definitely was aware of the visitation of the Father and the Son. Yeah. Uh, there's other places as well, for instance, burial services in ancient practice, for December 31st, 1876, which was published in volume 18 of the Herald Discourses. Um, this time he even says, I see there the father and the son, so he... Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll just read it for uh, those listening. And yeah. and again, there are uh, other things associated with these matters, all bearing or more or less upon the same points. When God selected Joseph Smith to open up the less, uh, dispensation, which is called the dispensation of the fullness of times, the father and the son appear to him Arrayed in glory, and the father addressing himself to Joseph, at the same time, pointing to the son, said, This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Here ye am. And then he goes on to discuss Moroni and so forth. So you clearly have pre Moroni explicitly the father and son appearing to Joseph Smith in a video. Yeah. Um, again, December 31st, 1876. And this was published in 1877 in uh, England, I will note. So you have like uh, the sermon. Um, here in the in the americas and then like in the uh, old world in britain you actually have it published by the printers so again global reach as well so okay so i think john taylor definitely knew about joe smith's first vision that he was visited by the father and the yep. son and there's one other one that's brief uh the interest of humanity should be observed march 2nd 1879 when the father and the son and Moroni and others came to Joseph Smith, he had a priesthood conferred upon him, which he conferred upon uh, others for the purposes of manifesting the laws of life, the gospel of the Son of God, by direct authority, that light and truth might be spread forth among all nations. So although he does not say, like, father and son appeared in the Trinity, and then Moroni three years later, you actually have the father and son appearing mm -hmm. to Joseph Smith at some time as well. So um, clearly he did know that the father and son just even based on this, appeared to Joseph Smith in a vision. And of course, like with the other evidence, he clearly didn't know about the first vision. It was a distinct event from Moreau and I, which was later, and so on and so forth. So I think he's a very good witness that the traditional narrative of the first vision was known, at least by him and others in his uh, company. Yeah. Uh, want me to just go on to Brigham Young? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So bring him up. He's the one that had the quote that. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll address that as well. So, yeah, sorry. the Lord didn't come with the armies yep. of heaven, but he sent his angel to the yeah. boy Joseph Smith or whatever. You probably may even have the quote. Uh, it's the very first. It's the very first one. Okay. Do you want me to uh, read it? Oh yeah, sure. Uh, this is uh, this is for uh, from the Constitution and Government of the United States, Rights and Policies of Latter Day Saints, and this is from February of eighteen fifty five. So actually, five years after John Taylor's letter and stuff like that. So um, and four years after the publication of the first edition of the Pearl of Great Price. But yeah, uh, if you want to read the um, the passage. Yeah. Okay. So the Lord did not come with the armies of heaven in power and great glory, nor send his messengers. Uh, is that panoplied with aught? Uh, yeah, panoplied. Yeah, he, he was pretty uh, wordy when he wanted to be, yeah. With aught else than the truth of heaven, to communicate to the meek, the lowly, the youth of humble origin, the sincere inquire after the knowledge of God. But he did send his angel to the same obscure person, Joseph Smith Jr., who afterwards became a prophet, seer, and revelator, and informed him that he should not join any of the religious sects of the day, for they were all wrong, that they were following the precepts of men instead of Lord Jesus, that he had a work for him to perform in as much as he should prove faithful before him. Okay, so um, the critical response from, like, say, the Tanners and others who use this argument is, like, Brigham is explicitly saying the father, uh, the father or the Lord, at least, never appeared to Joseph. He only worked through intermediaries here, an angel. Uh, that's the that's how the Tanners in Shadow Reality and other works kind of present the quote as. Yeah, and I think they would also say that you know, he sent his angel and and the angel informed him that he should not join, you know, any of the, you know, religious sects of yeah. the day. So they would almost say like he's either conflating or he's under the impression that it was the angel that delivered the message not to join any of the, the churches. Yeah. Now, this is why I uh, decided to like start with the Athanasius quote. It's like uh, what Athanasius said in the fourth century is true today. Uh, you have to take, Br if you can be studying Brigham on any particular topic, you have to take Brigham as a whole now yeah. uh the standard lds response and i think there's possibility to this and this is from fair uh don't shoot me for this uh cooper johnson d charles Pyle, and d charles Pyle is like a very smart cookie uh brigham does not say the lord uh brigham doesn't say that the lord didn't come ever he says that he didn't come with the 
armies of heaven, empire, and gain glory. In other words, he didn't come with a bunch of pomp and circumstance. And as a matter of fact, when you look closer at the entire quote, Brigham specifically says that the Lord did come. It was the angel who informed him. It was the Lord who informed him, not the angel. Read the sentence. But he did send his angel and he, the Lord, informed him, Joseph. So the quote uh, from Brigham takes on a whole new meaning when you look at the whole thing. Now, I think this is plausible and I think this is the correct interpretation, but it's still ambiguous. You know, because yeah, it's, I, it's I was going to push back and say, like, yeah, it could be. And so, yeah, yeah you're right, because it says, and he informed him. Yeah, so and that's the thing, like, it, 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 could, it could refer to the Lord, angel? but it could also refer to the angel. I mean, yeah. uh, unfortunately, Brigham out say, like, and he, by the way, I mean the Lord, so um, you naysers. The problem, though, is, like, Brigham did explicitly teach the first vision elsewhere. Yeah, and I think that's, that's important, because that's probably what gives that interpretation yeah. maybe some plausibility. For instance, this is from Establishment of the Kingdom of God, Gathering of the Poor, etc., March 3rd, 1861. So six years after this, but it's still like um, even before and after the initial quote, like people are still talking about the first vision. You know, we saw from John Taylor. So the Lord chose Joseph Smith, called upon him at 14 years of age, gave him visions and led him along, guided and directed him in his obscurity until he brought forth the plates and translated them and Martin Harris uh, was prevailed upon to sustain the printing of the Book of Mormon. All this was done in the depths of poverty, obscurity and weakness. So the Lord chose uh, Joseph, called him at 14 years of age and gave him visions. So... I think this is uh, a very good evidence that Brigham did clearly know about the first vision in 1820. Mm, and okay. so these contemporaries, like John Taylor, you know, who was his uh, successor, you know, he, as we've seen here, clearly didn't know about the first vision. And as we see here, even his theological sparring partner, if you will, Orson Prash, later on, didn't explicitly teach about the first vision. So whatever ambiguity about this quote is, and I'll grant you, like, although I think uh, the, this response is plausible, it still uh, rests upon an ambiguity. So I don't think, like, the critics or the apologists can't explicitly win the day if you will on this i think like in light of this quote and others of contemporaries uh and other publications brigham did clearly know about the first vision in 1820 and the lord was more direct if you will than this mm. no I, I think a critic may even even that last quote they could possibly say oh it's maybe a, a little bit vague or slightly ambiguous you know it says that the lord called upon him um you know when he was 14 gave him visions but doesn't clearly say that it was the lord that visited him but it's it's kind of implied but they might say it yeah and they would also have to explain like why brigham whenever brigham went against the mainstream and he did that a lot people called him up on it and he debated people about it like adam god uh, that's a pretty obvious example but here like you have to explain like why there's no furore about this brigham is not contradicting people as he would often publicly contradict people again orson pratt adam god comes to mind and also why is he how do you explain the contemporary evidence from people he knew who were teaching a personal appearance of the father and the son in 1820, not like through an intermediary, i.e. an angel, you know? And some of uh, these, these would have been like public, you know, yeah. talks they were given. So like at conferences. Been, yeah. He, at conferences, he would have been hearing this as well. So it's not like he, either he's not uh, referring to the father and the son or, or he is, but he's just been a bit, uh, ambiguous yeah. with it but there's no way he and also you, you have to keep in mind like there like if you're addressing fellow dire day saints there can be a lot of insider baseball I mean, like if you're giving a talk on the first vision for instance to a fellow lds congregation you're not going to go like into painful deal because you're going to assume they already know this you know um so there's going to be like a um a lot of preaching the choir here literally as well so yeah that's there's true. no need to reinvent the wheel uh, as if you know, like how you would um, discuss the first vision in a gospel doctrine saying to fellow LDS will be different. Not substantially so, but like in many respects, in, uh, there will be differences with, say, how you would have taught, like, someone who knew nothing about Joseph Smith on your mission, you know. Yeah, that's true, because if I were to refer to, you know, like, I might just say, you know, Joseph Smith had his first vision in 1820, but I'm, I may not always go into the detail that, oh, he saw God the Father and Jesus Christ, because you would assume if you mentioned it, say, in a Sunday school, people would you know what what that means we wouldn't have to go into detail yeah um but it also gets worse for the critics uh this is from how divisions were introduced in the christian world the gospel perfect but its teachers imperfect the priesthood and its restoration uh june 23rd 1867 uh when joseph was a bi joseph's mother one of his brothers and one if not two of his sisters were members of the presbyterian church and on this account the presbyterians hunted the family with great tenacity and in the midst of these revivals among the religious bodies, the invitation, come and join our church, was often extended to Joseph, but more particularly from, his pres uh, from the Presbyterians. 
Joseph was naturally inclined to be religious, and being young and surrounded with this excitement, no wonder that he became seriously impressed with the necessity of serving the Lord. But as the cry on every hand was, Lo, here is Christ, and lo, dear, said he, Lord, teach me that I might know for myself who among these are right. And what was the answer? They are all out of the way, they have all gone astray, and there is none that do it good, no, not one. When he found out that none were right, he began to inquire of the Lord what was right, and he learned for himself. Was he aware of what was going to be done? By no means. He had not... Uh, he did not know what the Lord was going to do with him, although he had informed him that the Christian churches were all wrong because they had not the holy priesthood, and he had strayed from the holy commandments of the Lord, precisely as the children of Israel did. So here Brigham is actually saying that the Lord told Joseph directly all the churches were wrong, they were corrupt, and so on and so forth. So it and there's no mention of like using an intermediary figure here, like an angel or some other Mm. figure as a representative it's actually the lord directly so it seems like he's cognizant of the traditional first vision account here because he mentions like the presbyterian influence on his uh parents and um his mom and these uh siblings and the religious commotion and so on and so forth you know um and then he says it's the lord he told them not to join any of the churches and so on and so forth so uh, yeah, it's, it's very consistent with the 1838 of Christ. Yeah, and he also mentions he was only about 14 years of age. So this would put it in like mm. um, 1820 as well. Okay. Um, uh, again, Brigham Young, personal revelation, the basis of personal knowledge, uh, philosophical view of creation, apostasy, involves disorganization, disorganization and return to primitive development, one man power, September 17th, 1876, and yes, they did use Puritan-like uh, titles for these works. Um, if you're familiar with Puritan, like a subtitle would be like the entire chapter of a book. <laughs> uh, Better Canon speaks of Christians. We are Christians professedly, according to your religion. People have gathered to themselves certain ideas and laid them down as systems, calling them religion, all professing to believe and obey the scriptures. They're religious... Uh, their religions are peculiar to themselves. Our religion is peculiar to God, to angels, and to the righteous of time and eternity. Why are we persecuted because of our religion? Why was Joseph Smith persecuted? Why was he hunted from neighborhood to neighborhood, from city to city, from state to state, and at last suffered death? Because, uh, that should be he. He received revelations from the Father, from the Son, and was ministered to by holy angels, and published to the world the direct will of the Lord concerning his children on the earth. So here, Brigham actually says one of the reasons why Joseph was persecuted is he received revelations from the Father, from the Son, and it was ministered to you by angels. So mm. again, uh, it's not like explicitly saying the Father and Son appeared to him in 1820, but at the same time, he received direct revelations from the Father and the Son. Yeah, sort of implies Yeah. That. Again, this is the type of insider baseball speak you would say to other Latter-day Saints without saying reinventing the theological wheel or the uh, doctrinal wheel, if you will. Um, Again, this is all consistent with being cognizant of the first vision accounts. Yeah. Yeah. So Brigham Young in these statements, it seems like he is um, implicitly, you know, sort of like referring to it, um, the visitation of the father and son. And even if you could argue that it's a bit ambiguous, certainly he was aware. You couldn't really argue he wasn't aware. Of yeah. It. So this this kind of goes back to like why I wrote Athanasius. So yeah, you have that kind of one kind of maybe ambiguous statement in one of these sermons but then you have all the other sermons you have to deal with and i just think it's intellectually more fair to uh, argue Brigham may have been a bit a uh, bit ambiguous in one place but he was rather explicit elsewhere so you know um the weight of the evidence would show the purportedly ambiguous one the he probably refers to god not the angel as some other lds have and that's like um some kind of post hoc rationalization it's like if you take someone try the whole ball of wax um you know it's, it's only intellectually fair to conclude Brigham didn't know about the first vision. Yeah, no, it, you should be intellectually fair and, and look at all the quotes and, yeah, not just cherry pick the ones that support your position. I don't I don't know if I'd read those quotes before, the, the ones that you just showed me. I don't know because I've, I've been on Feral already since, but I don't think they even have those quotes up unless I haven't found them. Uh, um, no, Mormonor, aka the B.H. Roberts Foundation, is the best place on the internet. <laughs> yes, I, I've been recommended to go there. I'm going to have to uh, search through that site. Looks yeah, really but uh, some of these uh, are actually on the Mormonor uh, website. Um, okay. But it's okay. okay, so Orson Pratt. Um, uh, Orson was a very interesting fellow. I'm not going to read all this, but this comes from an interesting account of several remarkable visions and of the late discovery of ancient American records, which was published in Edinburgh, Scotland in 1840, the account I mentioned at the uh, earlier. Is this considered his sec a second-hand account of uh, the first vision, this one? Uh, it, it would be second-hand because it comes from Orson, but it would be he would have got it from Joseph Smith. So Yes, okay. Uh, you know. 
uh, and this is 1840. Um, so at first, he, Joseph, was severely tempted by the powers of darkness which endeavored to overcome him, but he continued to seek for deliverance until darkness gave way from his mind, and he was unable to pray in fervency of the spirit and in faith, and while thus pouring out his soul anxiously desiring an answer from God, he at length saw a very bright and glorious light in the heavens above, which at first seemed to be at a considerable distance. He continued praying while the light appeared to be gradually descending towards him, and as it drew nearer it increased in brightness and magnitude, so that by the time that it reached the tops of the trees the whole wilderness for some distance around was illuminated in a most glorious and brilliant manner. He expected to have uh, seen the leaves and boughs of the trees consumed, and as the light came in contact with him, but perceiving that it did not produce the effect, he was discouraged with the hopes of being able to endure its presence. It continued descending slowly until it rested upon the earth, and he was enveloped in the midst of it. When it came upon him, he produced a, uh, it produced a peculiar sensation throughout his whole system, and immediately his mind was caught away from the natural objects with which he was surrounded, and he was enwrapped in a heavenly vision, and saw two glorious personages, who exactly resembled each other in their features or likeness. He was informed that his sins were forgiven. He was also informed upon the subjects which had for some time previously agitated his mind, namely, that all the religious denominations were believing in correct doctrines, and consequently, that none of them was acknowledged of God and his church and kingdom, and was expressly commanded to not go after them, and he received a promise that the true doctrine, the fullness of the gospel, should at some future time be made known to him, after which the vision withdrew, leaving his mind in a state of calmness and peace indescribable. Mm. So, um, one should read the entirety of the uh, passage, I'm just going to quote, I just quote like, so, the, some of the more relevant section, but uh, yeah. Orson, Orson Clary knew about the first vision. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, and, definitely. Uh, yeah, and there's other things as well. Like, um, if you're familiar with the Simpsons, the whole stop it, stop it, he's already dead. Uh, this is where the uh, gift will uh, be rather apropos. But like, uh, there's a discourse by Elder Orson Pratt delivered at the Tabernacle, Salt Lake City, February 24th, 1869, which was recorded in the Desert News um, three days later. Uh, when did the Lord manifest himself to this man, Joseph Smith? Read our history if you wish to understand all the particulars. On this occasion, I shall barely refer you to the early history of the church in print. The Lord revealed himself to that person, not in his manhood, but in his youth. We have heard much said by those who know nothing of this matter about old Joe Smith. How old was Joseph when the Lord manifested himself to him? He was about 14 years and four months old. So this would put it around like um, April of 1820, rather interestingly, the same month and year John Hyde, a critic, actually put it. Um, was that a very Asian man? Look around here at, in this assembly and hunt up uh, children 14 years of age, and you will immediately admit that they do not look very Asian. And then he mentions like uh, the religious uh, turmoil like amongst the Presbyterians and the Baptists, and how, as a result, after reading James 1.5, uh, Joseph went out into a little grove near his father's house in the town of Manchester, Ontario, uh, County, State of New York, and there he knelt down in all the simplicity of a shawl and prayer to the prayer to the Father in the name of Jesus, that he would show uh, him which among all the churches was the true one. Said he, show me, Father, who are in possession of truth. Let me know, O Lord, the right way, and I will walk during. Uh, he had now come to a person who was able to teach him. All his inquiries previously had been futile and vain, but now he applied to the right source. Did the Lord hear him? Yes, but he had to exercise faith. This young man, while he was thus praying, uh, was not discouraged because he was tempted, but he continued praying until he overcame the powers of darkness, so like the appearance of Satan here. And then it mentions how the heavens, as it were, were opened up to him, or in other words, a glorious pillar of light, like the brightness of the sun, appeared in the heavens above him. Uh, and approached the spot where he was praying, his eyes fixed upon and it, and his heart were lifted up before the Most High. And then it speaks of, um, I just kind of skip some of it. He mentions, like, again, the um, encircling of the uh, light and how he thought it would uh, be consumed. Yeah. And then two glorious personages whose countenance shone above with an exceeding great luster. One then spoke to them, saying, while pointing to the other, This is my beloved son, in whom I will pleased. Here again, so Father Jesus, 14 years of age. Religious turmoil, James 1 5, all the themes in the traditional first vision narrative. Mr. Smith, this young man, in the simplicity of his heart, continued saying to these personages, Which church should I shine? Which is a true church? And then he was told, like, not to join any of them. Like, again, the traditional narrative. I won't read all yeah. of it, but again, um, Orson did know about this. And there's a number of other things as well, like um, December 19th, 1869. Uh, by and by, an obscure individual, a young man, rose up and, in the midst of all Christendom, proclaimed, the startling news that God had sent an angel to him, that through his faith, prayers, and sincere repentance, he had beheld a supernatural vision, that he had seen a pillar of light descend from heaven and saw two glorious personages, clothed upon with this pillar of fire, whose countenance shone like the sun at noonday. Again, uh, this is my beloved son, hear ye him. So again, it's clearly the father and son, not simply two 
Heavenly Beings, whose identity yeah. is Ian Crescent here. Uh, this is Ian 69. Um, there's a bunch of others as well. Uh, I'm not sure if you want me to read them, but like uh, there's accounts as well in the Desert News, September 28, 1872. Um, Tyburn Lacker's Services, which is a summary of a speech Orson delivered September 19, 1880, where yep. the speaker, Pratt, gave illustrations to prove this and to substantiate his assertion that for centuries the world had been without the light of the gospel, without divine authority, and without Christian church. The beginning of the new revelation was coincident with the signing up of this church of Latter-day Saints. The speaker didn't describe the first vision of the prophet Joseph, something far different than that the world had been accustomed for centuries. And um, again, you have Orson Pratt, the divine attorney of the priesthood. Um, I don't have the year for this, but it was published in 1882. And there was a report of the same in uh, the Desert News of October 11th, 1880. Uh, yeah. You find a little by Joseph Smith calling upon the name of the Lord in the spring of the year 1820, before he was not yet 15 years of age, and as a result of calling upon the name of the Lord, was that pillar of fire appeared in the heavens above him, and it continued to ascend and grow brighter and brighter until it reached the top of the trees. And then it mentions, um, you know, a heavenly vision, two glorious personages, one was the father, the other was the son. And th how this was understood by the Desert News, when they were like given the summary of the uh, conference talk, uh, he, Orson Pratt, then referred to the first vision of Joseph Smith. When, but a by, he saw two personages, the father and the son, yet the sight did not consume him, although it was written that, without the priesthood, no man can see the face of God and live. The reason why he was able enabled to look upon the face of God and live was because he was chosen and ordained in the spirit world to the holy priesthood and was selected to come forth in this age to usher in the dispensation of the fullest of times. So, um, it's interesting because I've wondered about that scripture. Um, that if you know, it says it was it, what did you say, DNC 84? Uh, uh, section 84, like, uh, yeah, no man can see the father. Um, no, I think it's not speaking about the priesthood per se, I think it's about the power of godliness. Uh, uh yeah, Pratt did believe because Joseph was ordained to the foreordained to the priesthood. Uh, that was not an issue to see God. Right. Yeah, because there's other passages that, you know, like Moses, when he sees God, like the spirit of God has to come. Yeah, he has to be transfigured. And also Section 67 as well, verse 11, speaks about that. But yeah, here, I, I think it's fair to say uh, Orson definitely knew about the first vision. He's Yeah, no, he can't. I, can't anyone who claims... The, uh, anyone who claims Orson was uh, not familiar with the first vision, you might get like a... Um, statement where he sees Joseph saw uh, two heavenly beings or some kind of generic language like that, but it would be disingenuous to claim, well, you know, he's ambiguous here. So, like, um, he's clearly explicit time and time and time again throughout his theological career when, um, when the saints are in Utah about this. You know, yeah. It's not something that developed uh, for him anyway. No, I agree. No, you could probably argue a little bit with Brigham Young. Some of his quotes were a bit ambiguous, but with uh, Orson Pratt, not at all. And one thing that actually stood out to me, I think it was the 1841 um he referred to both um being forgiven of his sins and being told um you know not to join out of the churches which is interesting There's because there are teams of the 832 and later 832 yeah because... yeah because and we'll probably talk about this later but um you know critics would say his purpose for praying and what he's told changes from the 1832 to 1838 account now the 1835 talks a bit about both as well but i thought it was interesting in his account that he also refers to his sins being forgiven and being told which church. And uh, also, just just from a logical perspective, they're not actually in, in, inconsistent with one another. You can pray for two different things, but they're yeah. not like mutually con tra contradictory. You know, you can pray for a remission of sins and also know which church is true. Um, I I fell to see why that's in of itself an mm. evidence of inconsistency. An inconsistency or a contradiction would be X and not X at the same time, but they're not mutually exclusive at any time, you know, so. Yeah, because it seems like he's praying to, to, he wants to follow the right path. He, he wants to find salvation. He wants to join the right church and, that, you know, therefore also to receive remission of his sins, be on the right path back yeah, to God. Uh, 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 and as Dan Vogel, although I think he stretches things, like he, a lot of the uh, Smith family were religious seekers. And like for them, uh, I know like many of them did not believe there was a true church and like many of them were universities in some respects, but like uh, for like modern day religious speakers, um, if you believe that there's a true church, you know, you don't have like this completely Protestant or uh, deistic view of the church. There has to be a true church or at least a true gospel. But does that the uh, that doesn't mean like you're only going to pray to be guided to that. You also want to receive like a remission of sins. They're not mutually exclusive. So mm -hmm. maybe like in a future show, we can actually discuss like purported inconsistencies between the different accounts. Yeah, but, yeah, uh, yeah, let's yeah. do it. Yeah. Now this is Orson Hyde. Um, I'll, I'll address the journal discourses quote that you have in your video as the second part of the uh, the section. But uh, again, he was cognizant with the fact that 
in Joseph's 15th year, his 15th year would be in 1820, like 1805, his first year, 1806, his second year. 1820 would be in his 15th year. He would be in 14 years of age. Um, so, so it mentions like something that happened uh, when he reached his 15th year, he began to take uh, seriously the uh, importance of preparing for future existence and so on and so forth. Now, this comes from, I'm not going to, I've never studied German, so I'm not going to even try to pronounce this, but the English translation is a cry from the wilderness, a voice from the dust of the earth. Uh, this is from the English translation that's found in the Joseph Smith Papers website, the German, uh, which I'm sure is online as well, pages 14 to 16. But what happened in his 15th year? Well, he mentions like religious turmoil, James 1 to 5. You know, the standard background, if you will, to the first vision. And then Orson writes, and this is Orson Hyde, he considered the scripture an authorization for him to solemnly call upon his creator to present his needs before him with a certain expectation of some success, and so began to pour out to the Lord with fervent determination the earnest desires of his soul. On one occasion he went to a small grove of trees near his father's home and knelt down before God in solemn prayer. The adversary then made several strenuous efforts to cool his earnest soul. He filled his mind with doubts and brought to mind all manner of inappropriate images to prevent him from obtaining the object of his endeavors but the overflowing mercy of god came to um buy him up and gave new impetus to his fa uh, failing strength however the dark soon uh the dark clouds soon parted and light and peace filled his frightened heart once again he called upon the lord with faith excuse me with faith and fervency of spirit at this sacred moment the natural world around him was excluded from his view so that he would be open to the presentation of heavenly and spiritual things two glorious heavenly personages stood before him resembling each other exactly in features and stature they told him that his prayers were uh, had been answered that the lord had decided to grant him a special blessing he was also told uh, to not join any of the religious sects or denominations because all of them erred in doctrine and none were recognized by god as his church and kingdom he was further commanded to wait patiently until some future time when the true doctrine of Christ and the complete truth of the gospel would be revealed to him. The vision closed and peace and calm filled his mind. Um, I, may, maybe it's just me, but I think it's rather uh, obvious that Orson Hyde, when he wrote this German tract in 1842, again, contemporary with Joseph Smith, didn't know about the first vision. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I, yeah I, I, maybe like a naysayer, well, you know, it just says like two heavenly beings who looked like one another, you know, in... Um, mm. And it doesn't. It's not. It you know. It's not the Father and Jesus. It's like no. Well, I the context is well been... about uh, calling upon like uh, calling upon the Lord. The Lord giving him a blessing. One an answer from God. There's no mention that these are angels, or at least you know, um, could angels have been in the vision? Sure, but like these two personages who interacted with him directly. It's clearly the Father and Son. Yeah. Because he, he's cognizant the first vision, like James one five, religious turmoil, fifteenth year, not you know, so eighteen twenty, not eighteen twenty three, and of those other things, it's like. Uh, to claim, you know, well, just because he doesn't mention it's the father and son, so we can doubt it. I mean, that's, that's, I'll be blunt, that's just a uh, stupid apologetic. So, uh, yeah. I, no, I think it would just it, be more intellectually fair. Really yeah. Orson didn't know about the first vision in 1842 here. Yeah, no, even being objective, even if you're a critic, you can't dispute this passage and say, oh, no, he didn't believe it was the father and son. It's, it's pretty, pretty yeah. apparent. So this kind of brings up the, uh, because in your video, and uh, um, you know, you do raise like uh, what he says in general discourses 6, 3, 3, 5. So what about the following? And then this is like the Brigham Young, like, yes, Brigham Young said this, but he said a bunch of other things. So, you know, uh, some mon someone may say, if this work of the last days be true, why did not the Savior come himself to communicate this intelligence to the world? Because of the angels who committed, who was committed the power of reaping the earth and it was committed to no one else. So like usually the Paul, uh, I'm not saying you're a critic, but like say when you present a critical perspective on your video and others have as well, they say, well, it seems like Orson Hyde here, um, April 6th in uh, 1854, just 12 years after this tract came out in German, by the way, he seems to preclude that Jesus ever directly interacted in this dispensation uh, in, a, in a direct repertory way. Um, would that be like a fair summary of the... Um, yeah, yeah. No, anything? they would see it as, um, yeah, why did not the Savior yeah. come... To communicate yeah intelligence to the world so yeah if, if just reading this quote at face value that's probably how you would your takeaway sure sure but first of all it kind of begs the question like we have this explicit scene in 1842 where i don't care who you are he clearly is talking about the father and son appearing yeah. in 1820 so what happened you know and i think like uh could it be like you know orson may have slipped up or something like that it's possible but i think a better explanation actually comes if one actually reads the context of the drawing the discourses um you know uh, this comes from Parable of the Sower, etc. And the Parable of the Sower, of course, is in Matthew 13, you know, like, um, you know, the 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold, and so on and so forth. You know, it's it's a parable, even if you're biblically illiterate, you've heard 
of anyway. So uh, he actually began the uh, sermon by quoting Matthew 13, this parable itself, you know, on page 334, and the Bob code just comes from the page previously, 335. Uh, There's a time, brethren and sisters, when the harvest of the world must be gathered. For you recollect among the wonderful visions John saw on the Isle of Patmos, and this is important, he's appealing to the book of Revelation. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like a son of man, which is Jesus, Daniel 7, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle, and another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Trust in thy sickle, and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. It appears that there is not only to be a gathering of the wheat, but of the tares also, and that they are to be separated. So that just comes from the page previously to the quote, so this is the context of what's happening. It's the exposition of Matthew 4, uh, 13, the parable of the sword, but he also brings out the book of Revelation, you know, the revelation of John on Patmos. So, in, if you read the book of Revelation, um, God works, tr uh, when it comes to judgment, like, um, you know, to use a fancy term, eschatological or end times judgment and diseases and stuff like that, like um, cursing and stuff like that for the sinners on the world, he doesn't do it directly, he actually does it through the intermediate, uh, through angels. Like, he gives them vials, you know, to cast on the earth and stuff like that, you know, um, if you read the book of Revelation. For instance, Revelation 15, 7 to, um, verse 7 to 16, 1. Um, and one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials, full of the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your way and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. So this is an example of God working through angels, not directly himself, right. of meeting out her, uh, judgment or harvesting, if you will. So what Orson, especially because he actually does explicitly say he's getting this from the book of Revelation as well as Matthew, it seems to be it's the harvesting that's in view here, not uh, the first vision or establishing this last dispensation. So... He also says, harvesting is in sort of like bringing souls onto Christ, or like, yeah, converting. and of course, like, God does that, God can do that directly, but He often works through like missionaries or angels, so it's right. it's that context that's in view here, bringing people, people the gospel, but also judgment and stuff like that as well. And again, Orson does say he's actually borrowing this idea or getting these ideas from the book of Revelation, you know, um, where you actually have these angel intermediary figures, where God is working through them, not directly, but indirectly, if you will, to bring about his will. And he also asks, uh, when was the time of sowing? When we take a more extensive view of the subject, we find that the grand harvest is reserved until the last, until the winding up scene, for it is said, quote, the harvest is at the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels, by whose angels see this reaping dispensation was committed to the children of men. And that's on pages 334 and 335, 335, of course, being the quote that's uh, used. Uh, and that's said immediately prior to quoting Crafton. Um, and then he also says, some one may ask, if this uh, work of the last days be true, why did not the Savior come himself to communicate this intelligence to the world? But this intelligence is not about the dispensation, the restoration of the gospel, it's about the harvesting. That's the context here. Because the angels oh, was committed to the power of reaping the earth, and it was committed to none else. So it's about reaping the earth here. Uh, and after the mighty champions that hold the keys of this dispensation came and brought forth the intelligence at the time of the harvest was now, that the time of the end was drawn near, when the proclamation was made and the announcement saluted the ears of the children of men, what was to be done next? Behold, the gathering of the saints begins. That very moment a man or woman embraces the gospel, in these latter times, they began to see and understand by the spiritual truth. The first thing they think of is, we must go and see the prophet of God and learn the ways of the Lord from his lips. What is it that causes this desire in the hearts of the people? It is the spirit of gathering together, for wherever they, uh, we went, when, when first this gospel was sent to the nations and proclaiming the glad tidings, really bad eyesight so i have to screen a bit uh the first thing those who were awakened by our preaching would say we want to go to the headquarters to run together uh these were the feelings of the people come the circle and my acquaintance and experience um that's the quote with fuller context so okay. um, that's a lot of good context yeah so uh, um, a fair actually has a pretty good uh discussion on this on their page uh was orson hyde unaware of the details of the father and son appearing to joseph in the first vision where they kind of go through like the background of um section 110 and matthew 13 but even proceeding from that, um, Orson didn't know about the first vision in 1842. I think that's incontrovertible. So, on the face value of things, just like taking that one passage, it does seem like what's going on here. But if you read, like, he appeals to Matthew 13 explicitly at the beginning. He also appeals to the book of Revelation, and Revelation is full of 
God working through angels for like judgment and other things like that. And also this very context, what is in view here is not the establishment of the dispensation, but it's more like the harvesting, like the preaching of the gospel, other things like that, that God works through intermediaries. He doesn't do it, although he can, he doesn't do it directly. But it's not about like um, the establishment of the dispensation or uh, precluding the first vision. And as we know previously from 12 years earlier, not later, but earlier, he explicitly taught the first vision. And he's also in an environment, as we've seen, and um, where the first vision was talked about quite often. Yeah, so if, if that's what he meant, he would be outright contradicting himself yeah. by writing about the first vision uh, 12 years ago. And out. also the context fits this perspective yeah, better does, than yeah. Orson is unaware of the first vision. Yeah, no, that, that's really important uh, context and insights to that. Uh, do you, anything you want to add to that before we're going to go on? No, to no. That, okay, well, really it's good. Oliver Cowdery, um, and then we'll end with Lucy and William Smith. Um, now, uh, do you want to give the TLDR version of Oliver Cowdery? Yeah, so I believe this comes from the messenger and advocate. So I think he, he says in September 1823 that Joseph Smith was praying. I think both, I think he says in his account, both for forgiveness of sins and, um, you know, being right with God to know if a supreme being existed. And also, I don't know if he prayed to know which church he should join as well. Um, I can't remember the quote offhand, but I, I believe uh, the angel appears September 1823 in his room, tells him, uh, you know, his sins are forgiven and not to join any of the churches and to keep the commandments. That's that's sort of my... Yeah, yeah basically the head. argument. Yeah, you've done a good job. Basically, the TLDO version is like, it seems like, according to some critics, um, or, uh, Oliver believes the first vision the first vision, if you will, was Moroni in 1823. He's unaware of the 1820 first vision, if you will. Yeah. And he... uh, um, would you um, would you say, I think I've even read quotes of, you know, historians, BYU professors that probably most likely in the 1820s and maybe early 1830s, he hadn't really told many people about his first vision and that might be why they're well, completing things. Yeah. I don't believe that I don't believe for a second this is the case for Oliver and I'll explain why, but I do believe that may be the case. Like, um, and maybe we can explain that like in the next section afterwards, but I, I believe he would have understood it originally as a personal experience because there were many other people claiming to have seen visions and stuff like that. You know, um, I think Bushman and others have written about that and they've done a good job. So, um, an appearance of like say God and or Jesus was not, unique per se um, yeah there was for, quite a few but, other people in yeah. his area um yeah. in the new york uh, area that claimed during sort of like the revival periods to have visions of god or god and jesus yeah so uh he would have probably just like situated in that context and just viewed it for the most part as like a private affair it comes out rather explicitly in the injury to you count although of course the injury to you count is not only a private affair there's a bit more i think going on there but be that as it may um it was only later he would have understood the uh, the importance of it for the church and on a global level, but also theologically as well. Uh, I kind of know, like, some think when Joseph went into the woods and see God and Jesus, he knew all about God, like embodiment and stuff like that. It's like, you can find it in the first vision, but, like, Joseph's understanding of its importance would have grown and developed. He may have just viewed it as a vision, but not a theological um, triastis or something like that, because, like... In, in the present world, whenever God appears bodily, and maybe in like in a future show when we discuss can man see God according to the Bible, yeah. whenever God appears in bodily form, they would say, well, that's just an appearance of God in bodily form to communicate, but in his essential nature, he doesn't actually have form. He just does that as a way to condescend to the person to speak to them. That's probably how they would interpret like uh, Stephen's uh, vision of seeing oh, of God yeah, and yeah. he's on his right hand, you know, before he's stoned. I actually did a wee video on I, I saw that. My yeah, channel the, as well. the, the right. Yeah, we we definitely should discuss that. And yeah, like, uh, I because that's just that's torturous interpretation of Act Seven. But yeah, it's rather common. Uh, but yeah, Oliver Cowdery. Um, I'm gonna. Th this might be a bit lengthy, but it does kind of show like I have to color code this to make sense. But maybe it's just my OCD mind. But um, it helps. Yeah. Good. Um, before I begin, I think it's rather clear when you look at the evidence. Uh, Oliver is saying he's working from records. And one of these records was the 1832 account of the first vision. He actually knew about the 1832 account of the first vision. So he's actually, in the original letters, using this as one of the records to discuss with Phelps, W.W. W. Phelps, the editor of the Messenger and Advocate, the early history of the church. Because he wrote um, this two years after the 1832 account. Yeah, 1834. 
Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, basically, I'm going to argue. So, Oliver did have knowledge of the ancient Eighty Two history, and the and it's like the first vision is not tucked away in a footnote; it's explicit. So, um, if you if he had the first vision account of the ancient Eighty Two account, he if he had the ancient Eighty Two history, he had the first vision. It's no, there's no way he could have missed it. You know, it's not like say tucked away in like a subtle footnote or something like that. It's it's rather explicit there for a few pages. So. And I'll also explain why there's a shift from 1820 to 1823. Uh, I think, like, Roger Nicholson has done a good job on this. But um, he basically opens up uh, October 1834. Our brother Joseph Smith Jr. has offered to assist us. Indeed, there are many items connected with the fourth part of the subject that render his labor indispensable. With his labor and with authentic documents now in our possession, we hope to render this a pleasing and agreeable narrative. Well worth the examination and perusal of the saints. So Oliver Q. Phelps says, Joseph has been helpful. We have authentic documents. And my argument, and this is not new to me, like Matthew Brown, Roger Nicholson, and others have argued, one of these authentic records is the 1832 history, which of course includes the 1832 First Vision account. Right. So evidence of this. Um, you know, in his letter, uh, December 1834, page 42, Oliver writes the following, you will recollect that I informed you in my letter published in the first number of the Messenger and Advocate that this history would necessarily embrace the life and character of our esteemed friend and brother Joseph Smith Jr., one of the presidents of this church, and for information on that part of the subject, I refer you to his communication of the same published in this paper. I shall therefore pass over till I come to the 15th year of his life. So, 1820 here. A general struggle was made by the leading characters of the different sects for proselytes, or converts. Then strife seemed to take the place of the apparent union and harmony uh, which I had previously characterized the moves and exhortations of the old professors and cry, I am right, you are wrong, was introduced in their stead. So that's Oliver. Similar verbiage is actually found in the HRA2 uh, account. My uh, intimate acquaintance with those of different denominations led me to marvel exceedingly, for I discovered that they do not uh, adorn their profession by holy walk and godly conversation. Mm, uh, yeah. A similar parallel, again, in the same issue. This is Oliver. Um, in this general strife for followers, his mother, one sister, and two of his natural brothers were proceeded to unite with the Presbyterians. This gave uh, opportunity for further reflection, and as we will be seen in the sequel, laid a foundation, or was one means of laying a foundation for the attestation of the truths, or professions of truth, contained in that record called the Word of God. And also elsewhere on page 43, after Sean's solicitations unite with one of those different societies, and seen the apparent proselyting disposition manifested with equal warmth for each, his mind was led to more seriously contemplate the importance of a move of this kind. To profess godliness without its benign influence upon the heart was a thing so foreign from his feelings that his spirit was not at rest day or night. And this is actually verbiage for this is again found in the ancient 32 history. So when do you I think concern... he's getting this from the 1832 yep. account of Joseph Smith? He's clearly influenced directly by this because like in this here, yeah. in jo uh, I'm just going to use the abbreviation JS 1832. When I considered upon these chains, my heart exclaimed, well, hat, uh, well, hat the wise man said, it is a fool that said in his heart there is no God. My heart exclaimed all these bear testimony and bespeak an omnipotent and omnipresent power, a being who makes laws and decrees binds all things in their bounds, who fills eternity, who was and is, and will be from all eternity to all eternity. Another, Cowdery, page 43. To unite with a society professing to be built upon the only sure foundation, and that profession be a vain one, was calculated in its very nature the more it was contemplated, uh, the more to arouse the mind to the serious consequences of moving hastily in a course fraught with eternal realities, and this is the injury to Joseph Smith history, my mind becoming exceedingly distressed, for I became convicted of my sins, and by searching the scriptures I found the man that mankind did not come unto the Lord, but that they had apostatized from the true living faith. There is no society or denomination that built upon the gospel of Jesus Christ, as recorded in the New Testament, and I felt to mourn for my own sins and for the sins of the world. And in the follow-up letter, Oliver alludes to the first vision, an event that is presented as being prior to Moroni's visitation. This is page 78 of the February 1835 issue. This most assuredly was correct. It was right. The Lord has said long since, and his word remains steadfast, that for him who knocks it shall be opened, and whosoever will may come and partake of the waters of life freely. Uh, Oliver Cowdery's use of ja, with a jai unspeakable was used by Joseph Smith in the 1835 first vision account. Uh, the Lord never said, come, and this is, um, Come unto me, all ye that labor of heavy laden, and will give you rest, to turn a deaf ear to those who are weary. When they call upon me, he never said, by the mouth of the prophet. 
uh, lo, everyone that had thirsts, come ye to the waters without uh, passing it as a firm decree, at the same time that he should after come be filled with a giant unspeakable. And compared to the ancient five first vision account, a pillar of fire appeared above my head, it presently presently rested upon me and filled me with a jai unspeakable, and the 1832 first vision account has a jai use only was described Joseph's emotions after the first vision. My soul was filled with love, and for many days I could rejoice with great jai, and the Lord was with me. Uh, there's other routines as well, uh, one other following parallel, describing the events between 1820, the first vision, and 1823, Verulam's visitation, Oliver wrote concerning Joseph, on the evening of the 21st of September, 1823, previous return to rest, her brother's mind was un assured, uh, unusually wrought upon on the subject which had so long agitated his mind. His heart was drawn out in fervent prayer, and his whole soul was so lost to everything of a temporal nature that earth to him had lost its claims, and all he desired was to be prepared in heart to commune with some kind of messenger who could, who would, who could communicate to him the desired information of his acceptance with God. While continuing in prayer for a manifestation in some way that his sins were forgiven, endeavouring to exercise faith in the scriptures, on a sudden uh, a light like that of day only of a pure and far more glorious appearance of brightness burst into the room, and the 1832 first vision account, I fell into transgressions and sinned in many things which brought a wound upon my soul, and there were many things which transpired that cannot be written, and my father's family have suffered many persecutions and afflictions, and it came to pass, when I was seventeen years of age, I called upon the Lord, and he showed uh, unto me a heavenly vision, for behold, an angel of the Lord came and stood before me. So, in light of all these parallels, and I would say pretty strong evidence that the 1832 first vision account was one of the authentic records from Joseph Oliver was uh, using, it kind of begs the question, why did Oliver not explicitly mention the first vision? Yeah, uh, that's, one, that's one of the questions I have. Maybe we're going to answer this. Uh, I also, this question's in my mind, so I'm going to say it now. Why do you think, if Oliver had access to the 1832 account, and so he would have known that if he read the account that the Lord appears to Joseph, um, you can dispute, you know, was it God and Jesus or just the Lord he's referring to, but either way, because doesn't it say in that quote in the messenger and advocate, Joseph was praying to know if a supreme being existed. Yeah. So if he had access to that account and Joseph Smith had already seen the Lord, why do you think Oliver would have inserted that? Well, I'll answer that. I'll answer the last one first, and then I'll answer the first question by reading from Roger Nicholson. But okay. I, I've often believed that should be a rhetorical flourish because jo if Joseph was praying, of course, it really doubt he was an atheist. He probably knew there was a god. So, like, um, it was probably a rhetorical flourish. Like, you know, if there's no god, you know, strike me down. Um, you know, I just think like if you take like before and afterwards, it does seem to be a rhetorical flourish. Um, but uh, I'll answer. I'll answer the first question. Maybe we can get back to that. Um, it, yeah. So, why did Oliver not mention the first vision? And this comes from uh, Roger Nicholson's essay, "The Cal the Calvary Conundrum." Oliver's aborted attempt to describe Joseph Smith's first vision in 1834 and 1835, uh, published by Interpreter. Um, there's a substantial correlation between Oliver's history and Joseph's 1832 history, which we've seen before, indicating that Oliver had in his possession the 1832 history. Most definitely describes the first vision. Why didn't did Oliver give such an accurate description leading up to the first vision? And did not mention the vision itself because he actually skips ahead to year 17 and apologizes for like um it in the next issue it seems based upon his efforts to provide describing the vision in the second installment they have studied the importance of the event but was not allowed to describe it specifically one possibility is that joseph saw where oliver was going with the first installment of the story and decided that he was not ready to have oliver introduce the story of the first vision publicly at this time the story of moroni's visit and the coming forward of the book of mormon was already well known among church membership it would be expected this event uh, be included, there's clearly no reason for him to have skipped such an important foundational event in the prophet's life unless the prophet requested it of him. By 1835, Joseph was clearly relating the story of the first vision to others, but the story of the first vision would not become formally published until several years later, and, in conclu and he concludes with, prior to the discovery of Joseph's 1832 history and 1835 journal entries, Oliver's unusual 1834-1835 account uh, had been used by critics as evidence that Joseph made up the story of the first vision, since when the two installments are considered together, it appears that Oliver is relating the religious excitement to Moroni's visit. It has been claimed that Joseph did not solidify the details of the first vision of the story until 1838, in order to establish himself more firmly as a prophet during a church leadership crisis in Kirtland. However, a careful look at Oliver's history in conjunction with Joseph's 1832 and 1835 account shows that Oliver was quite consistent with the details. Oliver appears uh, knew more than he was allowed to write at the time. So, uh, it seems like um, Joseph did not want the first vision to be publicly announced without his say so. So, again, like if you read the uh, accounts and like the stuff uh, mentioned previously, it does seem like the 1832 first vision account was one of the records Oliver was working from.
That's yeah, because nice. there's about the first parallels in sort of like the, the the language and the wording that he he uses, uh, and he describes some of the similar things during that time period. But then he he skips the the vision, which I suppose it's speculation. Like there's no evidence of it. But then you would think, why else would he? Yeah, but not there's actually there are, like, it? there are like pretty good strong textual parallels between Oliver's account and the 1832 account. Yes, yeah, I think he showed even, that. Even like say. They mentioned a jai, which is a rare word in the A32 account, being used in the context of the first vision itself, and then like unspeakable jai, which fits like A35 yeah. and um, Oliver's account as well. So, and right, yeah. Well. So it just yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. So, so I was just gonna say. So, uh, Roger Nicholson says that the only explanation he can think of for why Oliver wouldn't have included Joe Smith's first vision is that Joseph Smith must have must have told him to yeah, not because because it's clear it. like if you read the earlier um it, it's like over you know sorry the a twenty leading up to it kind of borrows a lot of the stuff from the a twenty two account leading up to the first vision so it seems like joseph did not want it to be publicly announced for mm. whatever reason but again like you have it mentioned in a twenty five you also have it in a twenty two and if the a twenty two account is one of the authentic records and i think like a good case can be made um and it's been made by Roger Nicholson. It's been made by Matthew, uh, the late Matthew Brown. It's been made by a couple of others as well. Um, if you had access to the injury to your first vision account, um, of all again, of all the possible interpretations or explanations of what's going on here, um, the confl- um, the conflation account just doesn't work. Right. No, th- that's that's very good. This is new to me. I I didn't realize that he would have had access to his eighteen thirty two account when he was yeah. writing this. And also, I just mentioned this in passing. Uh, it's not explicit, but like um, in a letter, he uh, Phelps, the editor, uh, wrote to his wife Sally, June second, eighteen thirty-five. He mentions like how President Smith, i.e. Joseph, preached last Sabbath and gave him the text. This is my beloved son. Hear ye him. A rather important text for the first vision. He yeah. preached one of the greatest sermons I ever heard. It was about three and a half hours long, and unfolded more mysteries than I can write at this time. And Phelps uh, just doesn't elaborate on it. So I'm not saying this is evidence of the first vision or anything like that but it does seem like rather interesting only a few months later in june 1835 um joseph is given the sermon based on this is my beloved son hear ye him when at time when he's mentioning the first vision and phelps just mentions you know it's a great sermon ever you know three and a half hours long i just kind of wish there was some other record of this you know, yeah. to actually see it seems to be implying to the first vision yeah this is my beloved son hear ye him i don't know what else could be the context yeah and because around this time well, he's pretty open more and more open about the teophany he appeared yeah in 1820 so could it be like the first vision we'll never know and unfortunately phelps just doesn't he says like three and a half hours long and that's it it's like come on dude and this is just me speculating but he sounds like you know he's unfolding more mystery so it it maybe sounds like it might have been new to him no that's just speculation but maybe it sure. was like you know unfolding a mysteries to him yeah, so but what's what's interesting? Like, this is from like June of eighteen thirty-five, so not too long after Oliver's interaction and letters that were published. So, okay. know, we're not talking about like say miles down the uh, timeline. We're, it, it's it's only a matter of uh, months, really. Okay. Okay. So, any questions on that before I kind of go on to the uh, last nope. section? No. Nope. Okay. Uh, William, I'm going to deal with Lucy Max Smith and William Smith. Uh, personally, I do believe like they do uh, conflate the first vision of eighteen twenty with the first vision of Moroni in 1823. I think the evidence for that is overwhelming. Um, so I think there's an explanation for this, uh, largely because for them and for many early LES, the first vision was Moroni's visitation in September 1823. Once Joseph was more public about the first vision in 1820, it resulted in the conflation. Yeah. So uh, that's the TLDR version, but let me just kind of go through like some of this stuff. Now, uh, I'll deal with Lucy first. Uh, she wrote a letter to Solomon Mark, she, Solomon Mack Jr., January 6, 1831, that could be an allusion to the A32 account. I'm not persuaded, but like it could be. Joseph, after repenting of his sins and humbling himself before God, was visited by an holy angel whose countenance was a lightning and whose garment was white above all whiteness, who gave him commandments which inspired him uh, from on high, and who gave unto him by means of which were uh, before prepared that he should translate the book. And um, it's clear about the angel and stuff like that, but someone could claim, like, you know, um, the mention of from on high, that could be an allusion to the first vision. Uh, you know, compared to the injury to first vision account, um, I felt and mourned for my own sins. The Lord said in the first vision, Thy sins are forgiven thee. And after many days, I fell into transgression and sin and many chains. I called upon them, called upon again uh, upon the Lord, 
and he showed unto me a heavenly vision. For behold, an angel of the Lord came and stood before me. The Lord had prepared spectacles for me to read the book thereof. I command to translate into characters. And uh, section 20, verses 5 to 8, we've read that previously, so I won't... Very really similar to, to that passage, the first... Yeah, group. so... Uh, it seems like she's conflating things like it seems like she may have been familiar with like some of the teams of the 1821st vision account and some of the teams of the angel but like uh, maybe it's a conflation or maybe she only knew in 1821 about the angel and did not really know too much about uh a theophany and stuff like that however uh like lucy like william as we'll see below did clearly conflate the first vision the father and son with moroni's first visitation uh this comes from like um page 10 book three of her memoirs which she dictated after we ceased conversation, he went to bed and was pondering his mind in which of the churches were the true one, and but he had not laid there long till he saw a bright light enter the room where he lay. He looked up and saw an angel of the Lord uh, stood or standing by him. The angel spoke, I perceive that you are inquiring in your mind, which is a true church? There is not a true church on earth. No, not one, nor, and has there been since Peter took the keys of the Melchizedek priesthood after the order of the Son of God uh, into the kingdom of heaven? churches that are now upon the earth are all man-made churches so like there's some teams of the ancient 20, 20 account like which church should, should die and so on and so forth but uh there seems to be confession of the angel as well in 1823 so yeah because she talks about like laying in his room and the angel yeah. appearing in his room which would that's what happened in september 1823 you know she doesn't talk about him going to a grove of trees but yeah. i think william does in one of his accounts um he yeah, talks he, about him going to grove of trees yeah but he conflates that as well but yeah uh, I, again like lucy uh page six book nine uh but what was my joy and astonishment to hear my own son though by 14 years of age declared that he had been visited by an angel so in trinity but like angel here uh from heaven uh even at the time as i took a retrospective glance at former years when my mind was rested upon the errors which I had spent in listening to the instructions which Joseph had received, and which he faithfully committed to us, which we received with infinite delight, but none were more engaged than that one whom we uh, were doomed to part uh, with for Alvin. So this is after Alvin died, so after 1823. Uh, was not so happy as when he was counting the final success of his brother in obtaining the record. And now I fancied I could hear him with his parting breath, uh, conjuring his brother to continue faithful that he might obtain the prize which the Lord had promised him. So Lucy puts this, she mentions like Joseph is 14 years of age, so late 1819, 1820. But right. again, Alvin, who died in 1823, and the angel, it seems like she may have been familiar with the first vision, but like at this time, how old would she be? She would have been like 67, 68, I believe. Uh, so there might be like some issues about old age, but she clearly, at the very least, is complaining things here. And because, um, I think in my video, the quote I had of Lucy Smith, she talked about the vision being September 1823, so Joseph yeah. would have been 17. But in this quote, yeah, yeah, I think there, 14, I think she does mention elsewhere, like uh, she actually puts it in September 1823 as well. So, so perhaps she's getting a bit confused over the dates then. Yeah, and uh, Lavina Field and Anderson, uh, one of the uh, September 6, I will note, uh, in her book Lucy's book, a critical edition of Lucy Max Smith's Family Memoirs, she has a note um, on page 141, note 40. Where uh, in the minutes of Lucy Smith's October 1845 General Conference address, she gives the date of Joseph's receiving the plates as second, 22nd of September 1827. It was 18 years ago last 22nd of September, but continues, it is 18 years since I began to receive the gospel of God tidings to all people. Uh, this sequence suggests that she considered the Book of Mormon and not the first vision to mark the beginning of the restoration. So, like, all throughout, there is, be, there is a conflation. So, mm. when it comes to Brigham et al., clearly did know about the first version i think it's rather explicit when it comes to uh lucy i think an honest elias abolish would say uh for her the first vision was more or less visitation she may have only learned about the first vision of a trinity later but she was confu confusing things in her dictated memoirs and other things like that i think that's the uh yeah. best approach uh, and i think the implication would be well i know in joseph's 1838 account after his vision he goes home and his mom asks him like is all well or are you okay? And he's like, all is well. You know, I've learned for myself Presbyterianism is not true, but I, I, I don't think he, maybe that's all he told his family and he didn't tell them about his 1820 vision of the father and the son. Yeah, but that, he did that, tell that, them about that's Moran. my view as well. He, for him, yeah. again, it would be like more a private affair and only later in his life it developed and he understood the global importance of it as opposed to just the personal importance. Um, and the same way- Do you think he would have told her probably in that moment, you know, had she have asked or maybe soon after? Um, okay. Well, he was, uh, if you read her memoirs, he was pretty explicit about the angel appearing and other visions. He may just kept the first vision to himself because he thought it was a private affair. 
it seems like when he shared it with a few other people, he was condemned because um, it's, Presbyterians historically are what's called uh, cessationists. They don't believe in these spiritual gifts, let alone visions in the latter days and stuff like that. So um, he, w he wouldn't be now. Um, he wouldn't fit in like when the very Calvinistic idea of like say um revelation and stuff like that you know so yeah and the account with moroni isn't it in the 1838 account moroni tells him to go tell his father yeah. as well uh, yeah after so that's yeah, maybe after why moroni, they're aware yeah, yeah so uh yeah so there's other considerations i think there's explanations as to why this is the case but she's clearly conflating things i don't think there's any yeah. wiggle room about this and the same when it comes to william smith uh, i'll be brief but uh the best treatment of this is actually eldon j watson who's an expert on the sermons of brigham young uh the william smith accounts of joseph smith's first vision from 1999 on his website um he basically argues that uh william when he's writing like the 1870s and 1880s he's, he's clearly conflating the first vision of 1820 with Moroni's visitation all throughout like uh, William Smith on Mormonism and these other works as well uh, I'll just quote him here um, the third William Smith account and he goes through the other William Smith accounts as well in the essay is a report of a discourse which he delivered in a church meeting in Det uh, Delight, Iowa June 8, 1804 so well into old age the account f conforms in most specifics with the earlier and longer 1883 accounts which Watson dealt with as well in this discourse William related it must be remembered that just before the angel appeared to Joseph, there was an unusual revival in the neighborhood. It spread from town to town, from city to city, from county to county, and from state to state. My mother attended these meetings, and being much uh, concerned about the spiritual welfare of the family, she persuaded them to attend the meetings. Finally, my mother, one sister, my brothers, Samuel and Hiram, became Presbyterians. Joseph and myself did not join. I had not sown all my wild oats. At the close of these meetings, the different ministers began to beat around and see how many converts they could get to join in their res uh, respective churches. All said, come and join us, we are right. Where is the gospel of Christ? Where is the church of Christ? Uh, there's a lost gospel, there's a lost church. And then he kind of goes on and on and on. Uh, but basically he conflates 1820 with 1823. And this actually has led some, like, say, Vogel and Marquardt and Walters to argue that there, these are witnesses that the revival, you know, was actually 1823, 1824. Um, I think Michael Quinn has done a very good refutation of that, of all people. But, um, you know, he, he does clearly conflate things. And then he, Watson concludes... Um, on the morning of September 22nd, 1823, after being served directly by the angel, Joseph called his family together and related them his vision and experiences of the previous e evening with Moroni, an angel sent to, uh, to him from God. Twelve-year-old William Smith was there with the rest of his family as Joseph explained the events in Moroni's visage of the evening of September 21st, 1823. It appears that prior to this time, Joseph had not related to his family his initial visionary experience of some three and one-half years earlier in which he saw both God the Father and Jesus Christ. It would also appear from the published text of an interview by Reverend Murdoch, that William was unaware of Joseph's first vision as distinct from his visitation by the angel Moroni as late as 1841. But prior to 1841, of course, like loads of people were discussing the first vision independent of Moroni, as we've seen here, like Orson Pratt, Orson Hyde, etc. Yeah. William superimposed in his mind the accounts of these two distinct visitations, and in all of the, his subsequent life, he never adequately distinguished between them. When he's in his declining years, William related uh, accounts of Joseph's first vision. He intertwined in his narrative events from both visions and depicted them as though they had been a single event, ascribing undue authority to William Smith's statements in interpreting Joseph Smith's own personal accounts has caused some to find inconsistencies in LDS church history, Tanners, Marquardt, et al. The most apparent of these is the transporting uh, of Reverends Lane and Stockton into Palmyra in the period of Joseph Smith's 1820 first vision, when in fact they did not arrive upon the scene until the 1823 time frame something even LDS apologists have been guilty of. Joseph uh, Smith never mentioned either of these two Protestant ministers by name, and William Smith should not have, at least in relation to his brother's first vision. So I think that's the best explanation as to what's going on. Yeah. There's a confession, but it's not, well, Joseph was making crap up as he went along, and you see this with William. It's like, no, first vision for most LDS in the early years was Moroni's visitation. It was only later Joseph, recognizing the importance of the 1820 vision, understood uh, its importance, and that became the first vision you know, so. did, did William and Lucy, did they follow um, Brigham Young to Utah? No, William no. was all over the place. Uh, he joined various churches like McLellan's group and other groups as well. And they kept kicking them out. They, they wanted to like, uh, give him uh, authority because he was the church patriarch, I believe, for a while of the mainstream church and things like that. But um, he, he, he wandered all over the place. Lucy remained right. with the saints and um, she was a uh, with the then reorganized church after. Um, That's right. Or at least yeah. like, she remained there. I forget when she died, but like the regarded stage was like the 1860s. So I think she died beforehand. But, but, but by the late 1830s or certainly the early 1840s when the the official, you know, version was publicized, that 
unpublished, they would have been aware of him seeing the father and the son, but they're just conflating. Well, I don't know. I, well, that's the thing. I don't know what Lucy read, you know. Uh, but at the same time, it's clear, presenting from like Lucy and William, the first vision, father and son, or at least two heavenly beings. He was not the angel of Baroni in 1820, was being discussed and presented. Yeah, because one thing that stood out to me whenever you actually read their accounts, that they actually contradict each other. Because Lucy says it was the angel appearing to him in his room, but William says it was the angel appearing to him, but in in the grove of trees. You know 1823 but then in one of lucy's accounts she says when he was 14 so there there's actually a lot of contradictions in their accounts yeah and i think it's uh due to i don't think they were like fudging things that i just no. believe that it's because of sincerity for william um again he, he would have his early days first vision was mirror night then later he would have conflated the two especially later in his age i think the same thing is going on with lucy conflation as a result of initially believing the first vision was Miro and I. Because as Anderson noted, like for Lucy, when she's uh, dictating her memoirs in 1844, 1845, uh, the, singularly, uh, the singular point of the beginning of the Restoration was actually the Book of Mormon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But funny enough, you don't actually have these inconsistencies when it comes to Brigham, Orson, and others. You know, no, these, are, these, these are the issues you would expect if the critics are correct about Brigham and Orson and others. But you don't have yeah. that. But you do have it here. As I said, like I'm more than willing to concede these are conflations, you know, uh, and these are the more problematic ones. But I think they can be explained away, especially. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's consistent with like, um, you know, Joseph came up with the first vision way late, and it wasn't an issue. It's just like because you have contemporary accounts like Orson and others, clearly explicating it, you know. Um, and I think there's this assumption that Joseph Smith, after his first vision, would have went home, would have written in, in his journal straight away, and would have told his family. I saw the father and the son. You know, I, I would have loved that that was the case, but unfortunately that's not the case. And yeah. it does seem like it was a private affair. He may have told others, but he would have been shot down. Because, yes, like uh, in some groups of the time, like the religious seekers and stuff like that, they, especially like um, the shakers and others, they did believe like the ongoing gifts of the spirit and some type of public revelation, you know, like the sacred book and roll of the shakers and things like that. But for like, say, the more refined american protestants at the time like the churches of christ the restorationist movement or the presbyterians if you read the westminster confession of faith uh not only did not believe in public revelation or the cessation of say visions didn't, most did not even believe in the cessation of speaking in tongues or other uh of the other gifts as well they were full-blown cessationists so i think um joseph was going against the grain um if he did mm -hmm. share it with others because like right. he did say like how he tried to share it with like a minister but he, the minister who was a methodist so theologically they would be closer to like a later mormonism than calvinism because mormonism has been described quite rightly as uh, basically arminianism on steroids um mm. he, he was basically shot down and, like there's no such thing as visions and stuff like that you know public revelation ceased with the death of the last apostle the very solo scriptura assumptions of protestantism at the time even with some of the ra more radical groups like uh, the churches of christ by campbell yeah Okay. Dang. Well, that was a really good, um, thorough, I think, objective analysis, which is what I want on, on my channel and providing all the context and quotes that go against it. And so it's, I think in summary, it's very clear that the early church leaders like Brigham Young, John Taylor, um, Orson Pratt, Orson Hyde knew and uh, talked about the visitation of the father and the son for the first vision. Um, Oliver Cardew was most likely aware of the 1832 account, but perhaps was told not to write about it in the 1834 Messenger and Advocate. But there's parallels in the language that he was borrowing from the 1832 account. We, and, he and, and he does explicitly state in the very first place he's he's using authentic records, and he yes. mentions Joseph Smith being helpful for it. So, I if if Oliver did have access to the 1832 account, that's the critical interpretation blown out of the water yeah yeah and then with with william and lucy most likely a conflation they weren't aware about the visitation of the father and, and the son their belief of the first vision was the angel well Baruch and I. they wouldn't have known about it straight away but like they may have been familiar with it, but because like tradition and stuff like that and like old age and stuff like that they definitely yeah didn't conflate, yeah so. no that, that's grand um i know you said if time permitted to maybe look at some other things do you want to do you want to leave it there for today? Do you want yeah, to take maybe, a break? Maybe, I think, maybe a good thing to discuss maybe would be like maybe purported inconsistencies, but also maybe either in the same episode or a follow up episode, uh, scriptural teachings on can man see God? 
Yeah, um, yeah, that would be good. Yeah. Because funny enough, like um, I've been looking at this issue for years. Like one of my favorite topics is discussing not just Christology, but like the number and nature of God, like embodiment and what does image and likeness mean in Hebrew and stuff like that. You even have like Trinitarian scholars saying, um, if we argue God the Father cannot be seen, you have a tri- you have a problem with the Trinity because Jesus is consumpt- uh is the same being as God the Father. Different person, but same being. He's con- consubstantial with the Father. So yeah. how could people see the pre-mortal Jesus before the incarnation, you know, taking on flesh, but not the Father? Is there a, you would have to go against the Trinity there. And even mm. like some scholars like Andrew Malone saying, um, it, it's a problem to say it's only the, you can only claim Jesus appeared in the Old Testament. The Father did appear as well. And some of these texts that we've used to claim that the Father is intrinsically invisible don't hold up you know you have like a swart of like tr- even trinitarian scholars who would probably think mormonism's an evil religion and a false gospel and we're going to hell when they're not addressing mormonism it's like uh, dudes like john 1 18 and john 6 they don't mean you can't see god they just can't mean you can't behold god for a very long period of time or you know enjoy his presence you know um mm. so i think that would be like a maybe a fun uh, discussion for either an individual episode or a um an inconsistencies episode as well yeah that's, that's often raised together. by evangelicals you know uh, like you know what does 1 timothy six sixteen mean and stuff like that you know so yeah yeah no that, that'd be awesome so yeah. we could either take a break or we'll do that as a, another episode another time yeah we're happy awesome. to do that so yeah awesome well uh, i guess we'll just we'll we'll close it if you've got nothing else to say on that but i think that was very thorough uh, yeah, it's just like, um, if anything, it kind of shows the importance of going to the sources. Like, uh, the general discourses, they're online on the BYU, sp- the Harold B. Lee Special Collections Library, if you want scans. Uh, I have, like, a set myself. You know, the green books there, that's that's them. But um, when it comes to the first vision, at the very least, def- and this is not addressed to you, I know you've done this, but, like, people listening, justsubmitpapers.org, you can go through yeah. all the different accounts. They've been published as well in the book Opening the Heavens, which actually has a very good essay harmonizing the different accounts as well. Uh, also a website and I'm a little biased when it comes to this, but there's this group called the BH Roberts foundation. Um, you know, not only do we post uh, very good memes on the Mormon or, uh, Instagram page and Twitter, but if you go on Mormon org, that's Mormon, but an org, uh, you can go to an article briefly addressing like various issues about the first version, but also a primary resources page where you can go to like, and see scans of say Joseph Smith's accounts of the first vision and scans of some of the pages of the journal discourses and Brigham Young at all discussing the first vision and other relevant topics and we've I work for them so I say we uh there's other issues as well that are addressed as well so um that would be a yeah. very good and it's accessible and it's it's resource free, so that's awesome yeah we'll have to put those links in the description and you as well like you're you're a scholar you've got so much knowledge of the wider context so I think if people have any questions about this topic with the first vision that you're a good source to go to as well. You can direct them, you know, places to you know, check out this article, you know, read this book, see what this guy has to say, sure. you know, provide that fuller, fuller context. And and also, uh, not related to the first vision per se, but uh, my blog as well, uh, scripturalmormonism.blogs.com, yes. where um, I discuss many biblical exegesis and Latter-day Saint theology and other things as well. So Yeah, so check out his blog scriptural mormonism he's also got a youtube channel which i believe is also called scriptural yep. mormonism so go check out his channel uh, I have, I, and just listen. speaking about the nature of god this thursday i will be having an interview with blake ostler uh because we both have a similar reading of the king full of discourse in sermon the grove so we'll be responding okay. to criticisms all that so awesome so check check that interview out then well thank you so much uh for for coming on robert thanks everyone so much for joining and I will see you next time. If you've enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. Uh, put some comments underneath if you have any questions or any comments you want to give. Share this video with other people. We're trying to be fair and objective, you know, to look both sides of the argument and to present uh, the evidence. And if you want to support me, you can to my PayPal, stephen.murphy1996 at outlook.com to keep these great episodes going. Thanks so much, Robert. My see you pleasure. Next time. It's been fun.